Like I just found this hair like laying on the desk and I don't think I realized just how long my hair's getting until I pulled this thing out of nowhere. And now it's just like, how soon can I get a haircut? Hey everyone, welcome back to Saturday Morning Toy Tubes, the weekly live stream on my channel in which we gather and talk about um, all things that happen in the Weekend Geek, or some of the things that happen in the Weekend Geek, because I think a lot of stuff happened in the Weekend Geek, and we don't have time to talk about it because we got a special guest coming on the channel today. Uh, that's right, I've been talking about this for weeks, months, maybe, even years? How long have I been doing this? Just over a year, so not years, not plural, but maybe a year. Um, my good friend JP Mavinga is going to be joining us later on in the show. And we'll be talking about all kinds of stuff because we haven't talked in a long, long time. I think the last time we spoke was Comic Con 2022. Yeah, yeah, that would have been it. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't like a sit back, chill conversation. I mean, we were just hanging out at uh, at the sideshow booth and uh, talking about the Black Panther premium format. We'll probably touch on that a little bit today. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about his art, what he's been doing. He's done work. For those of you who don't know, JP is um, among He's an outstanding artist, probably the finest artist that I've ever met. My camera's crooked. OCD. I'm not OCD. I'm just saying that. Um, he's uh, one of the, he's probably the finest artist that I'm, that I'm acquainted with. I don't know. I've, I know a lot of artists. Um, people like Emil Garfong are up there as well. But um, yeah, he's really really talented. Uh, I've got some of his work hanging up in here, although you can't see it because it's up too high. It's it's uh, it's up here above Chadwick Boseman above above the Chadwick Boseman print. Um, so that's, that's going to be cool. It's going to be a lot of fun to catch up with him. And, uh, what else has he done? God, he's, I met him because he was working at a, as a designer for Sideshow at the time that I was employed full time before this time. And he, I'm sorry, my, my camera's going out of focus because there we go. The focus point. I didn't do the reading. I didn't do the homework, but, uh, yeah, it's. He used to come into my office all the time um, when I was uh, putting together figure photos and we'd talk about stuff and he'd share with me his experience. So we'll get into that a little bit. I don't want to repeat myself too much. Uh, things that you may know him for, he has... I'm going to pull up a... Uh, I'm going to pull up a screen here. If I can. There we go. Yeah, he has been... Um, inst he was instrumental in the creation of this. The Thanos on Throne pre on premium format, actually maquette by Sideshow, and um, all that, all that you're seeing there, all this, all this amazing detail. That's that was him. He did. He he had so much to do with that. I know that there were other designers involved, but I think that he really picked up the ball with it and, and kind of changed it into what it is today. Look at that thing wobble. Look at that thing wobble. It was so big that I just couldn't keep it steady. So anyway, getting back to it, uh, how's everybody doing? Get any new toys this week? I did not. I had a toy-free week. I'm gonna have kind of a toy-free month. I've got some stuff. I've got my sideshow Christmas presents coming, so that'll be fun. That'll give me some stuff to show off. Kind of, maybe, because pretty much everything that's getting sent to me is so big that I don't think I could fit it on the screen from here. I'd really have to go wide, so to speak, and even then. Even then, at least one of them is just, there's just no way I'm ever going to be able to show it in this format. I might be able to do it some other way. But anyway, let's go to the top and see who's here. I want to say hello to everybody before I'm moving along to talk about other things. Uh, PRP, first out of the gate this morning. Um, got off to a late start, by the way. That is for our guest because he is on the West Coast and I wanted to give him time to sleep in. Coffee up, do whatever he needs to, to be alert and, um, and actually enjoy himself while he's here. Um, Steve Norris here as well. What's going on, Steve? <clears throat> How's things in Virginia Beach? It's raining here, which means it's probably on the way to you. In fact, I think, yeah, East Coasters are going to have some have some serious inclement weather coming their way. Keith Lee is here. See you tonight. Um, what's up, my favorite people? What's up, some guy? Good to see you. Linda's here as well. She got here early. Gina B. Collecting was actually able to join us early because I started late. Happy to help, Gina. Happy to help. Best Gar Kid is here. Assuming he brought his thighs. Uh, got my punch bowl full of cereal and coffee ready. I had donuts today because my cupboard is bare. My cupboard is very bare. I think all, all that I have left is like oatmeal and a few eggs, some goat cheese. Yeah, probably a jar of jalapenos that 
has no business still being in there. I don't know. Because most of my jalapenos I use for our fresh. Uh, that's more of some guy. Best guard kid is here. What's up, dude? Good to see you here. Wait. I already said hi to you. God. Stop messing with me, man. Stop it. Laura Keeles is here. How you doing? Everything going well? How was your car crash? Any fallout from that? That was you, right? I don't know. I'm j it's it's all falling apart. <laughs> Better troll us here. What's up, dude? <clears throat> How's Tennessee? A lot of Tennessee in my life. I married a Tennessee girl. Never again. Never marry again. Uh, figure posting channel is here as promised. I had a nice long chat with Anthony yesterday. Good to uh, good to see you here. TK421 is here. Morning all. How's it going? It's going pretty well. Ah, he brought the beers. That's cool. It's afternoon there. You can do that. I've got one beer here after last night. Oof. Man. Yeah. <clears throat> that wasn't this week, though. In fact, I'm overdue paying the taxes on it. I've got it. I was going to go yesterday, but um, I had to work. So I'm probably going to go early on Monday morning and uh, pay those taxes. Sixteen hundred dollars, yeah, something like that. Ouch. <laughs> see who else I'm missing here. Patrick's here. What's going on, Patrick? Hello, good to see you. Uh, I'm really tired today, guys. I really, really, really tired today. I considered canceling. Commander Green is here. What's going on, dude? He's cranking out some good stuff on his Instagram account, as always. And that's about it. It's quiet crowd today. I guess I guess when you don't lead with a um, live posing of hot toys on your thumbnail, then uh, you don't quite draw the crowd. But that's okay. People are going to enjoy the chat with JP, I think. I know I am. Looking forward to it. Hmm. So, what's new in my world? I have begun reading again. For the longest time, I gave it up. I hadn't been reading for a very, very long time. And um, I just wasn't able to focus on it. I just kind of lost interest in it. And um, just out of the blue, is it here? No, I think it's in my, my room. I'm not going to go get it. It's just a book, right? Um, I, from out of the blue, I picked up a book called Fairy Tale by Stephen King. And I've historically, I was a big King reader. Like in high school, early college, I just devoured his books. Big fan of it. Um, big fan of oh god, I'm gonna draw a blank. because it's live stream brain. I'm gonna draw a blank on all the titles by King that I've read in the past. Um, obviously, uh, The Stand was a huge one. I read that multiple times. In fact, I might have been in England the first time that I read that. I think I was. Not that that's relevant, but but yeah. Um, and uh, it took a Stephen King book. To draw me back into reading, let's let me just alter that a little bit. It took a Stephen King book and my daily visits to TMS therapy to really do the trick because I had a 45-minute gap between treatments with nothing to do and I didn't want to spend it all on my phone. So I picked up that book and just started reading and it just pulled me in, pulled me in. Such a great, great read. King has a cadence that's familiar and comfortable. And I think that had a great deal to do with it. He's got a very distinctive style that um, that really comes off. And again, it's it's very easily digestible. I think that that's why he's that's a good part of why he's so popular, because a really broad range of readers uh, will be able to um, to to go with that particular flow and that cadence that I talked about. So yeah, definitely enjoying that. Um, and I'm done with that. I finished it. Read it all the way through. And uh, I'm currently trying to decide if I want to... The last book that I tried to read before giving up on reading was The Stand. I'm sorry. <laughs> the Shining. And um, I got about two-thirds... No, about two-fifths of the way through that one. If the page marker that I spotted was any indication. So I'm trying to decide if I want to read that. Finish reading that. Start that over. Or jump immediately into Dr. Sleep, which I already started to read before I spotted that. I started to read Dr. Sleep, got like a chapter into it, and then I spotted the co my copy of The Shining laying over there on top of a stack of other books. And I was like, well, now, so now I've got some thinking to do. So I didn't do much reading then. Anyway, I'm 
I don't even know if we have a lot of big readers out here and, and who are, like watch this channel, so maybe not. Um, what else do I have to talk about? It's entirely possible that I'm going to run out of things to talk about before JP gets here. That's what happens. You know what I could do? I could do my weekly taunting of, um, of Commander Green by pulling up some clones that he doesn't have. I don't think you have these, right? Sideshow's finest days, man. Sideshow's finest days. Seriously. And my memory of it, of it was that, like, the guys that were making these weren't even... weren't Clone Wars fans at all. Um, but they were just pros and did their jobs and did it well. And it, and it evolved over time. It got better with every subsequent release. I think that this wasn't the last of them, but this was very, very close to the end for the clone for the clone trooper line that Sideshow did. And it really shows. I, I wish I had an early clone trooper to like highlight the difference. And I guess I'll get to that when I if and when I finally get around to doing my clone trooper video. Um oh, looks like uh, Laura Keyless is with me on uh, on that, yeah. That's you know what that is? That's love. That's love of a book. That's what, how I feel about it. And that's, I used to like, I used to prioritize buying books in hardcover. And I guess maybe I'm getting older now or whatever, but I feel like th they're heavy, they're cumbersome. Trade paperbacks are really where it's at. And the thing about trade paperbacks is that they don't take the abuse as much as the hardcovers do, obviously, because they're soft cover and, you know, by definition. But, um,. I think that um, I think that I've grown to appreciate the little nicks and the folds in the cover and the and the coffee the coffee stains that will invariably develop at some point on, on at least one book probably in the next month, and that just kind of it kind of tells its own story at that point, right? So yeah, I've I've got a very real love now for trade paperbacks. Hard covers are not essential. In fact, I. I would rather not, when it comes to fiction, especially, or even nonfiction, not uh, not comic books. I think my comic books will continue to be hardcovers, but um, the um, but yeah, pros definitely gonna stay with trade paperbacks. I just want to beat them up, show them how much I love them. <laughs> Speaking of Stephen King, I'm watching uh, Lisey's story. I'm on episode, I'm, I'm coming up on episode six. I'm starting episode six very, very soon. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. Lisey's story is King's self-professed favorite book that he's ever written. And they turned it into a, um, an eight episode miniseries on Apple TV Plus. Starring Julianne Moore, um, Jennifer Jason Lee. Is that right? Jennifer Jason Lee? I always get her confused with the other one. Which one was in... Um, in uh, the movie about the roommates, the psycho roommates, psycho stalker roommate. Anyway, um, Clive Owen is in it. Um, it's it's a star-studded cast and well worth a look. Uh, the main villain in it is decidedly creepy. I mean, he gets it. He knows how to play a king villain. Um, <clears throat> and he's kind of a creep anyway. I, again, another actor whose name I can't remember, but he was the one that played the main character in Chronicle. Yeah, Josh Trank has been in my in my orbit lately. In my orbit lately, I just, was just watching a video about the Trank cut of um of Fantastic Four and how that never materialized and how he wound up becoming a Hollywood pariah, um, which I I hate I hate for the guy I I don't know. Okay, Jennifer Jason Lee was in Single White Female, so yeah, she's the one that I'm thinking of. She's uh, she plays the sister of uh, Julianne Moore. Dude, yeah, seriously, right? You have to have seen. What's the um, what's the sci-fi movie he was in about a future in which humans have stopped having children? The Children, I think. Right? I think it's just called The Children. It's really, really good. He's good in it. Really, really strong guy. Actor. Really, really strong actor. I don't know how strong he is. Not as strong as you, probably, Beskar. But uh, but then again, who is? Not many. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's. I will tell you this, Laura. You should look for it. Um, and yes, Apple TV Plus is almost always on point. I finally had my first disappointment with them. I won't say. I won't talk about it. Most mostly because I can't even remember the name of the film. But um, yeah, it was. It was really. I was really, really disappointing. That's it. That's it. TK421 sounds off, and so does Best Guard Children of Men. Great, great film. But uh, getting back to that, um, it's a slow burn. The first, and it's really bizarre. It's not for everyone. I think it's it's definitely not one that you want to watch while also browsing your phone. It's it's very you have to stay focused on it. You have to stay focused because there are things that are happening visually while a character is, you know, having like a monologue or, you know, soliloquy or what have you. Definitely, definitely worth just staying laser focused on. Yeah. Renz Tolentino is here, another outstanding artist. Speaking of artists, what's up, dude? Good to hear from you. I'm just gonna check really quick to see if I've heard back from JP. Okay, yeah, he's he's still on it. <coughs> I should probably message him and just be like, if you want to come on now, that'd be great because I might not have things to talk about. Oh, um, I'm finding things to enjoy about Monarch. Um, the stuff that happens in the past in the 1940s, very, 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 very cool. Um, I love a lot of what's happening there. Um, I love the monster bits. Anytime the Godzilla shows up is a fun, is a good thing. That's why we're all there. Um, the um, I'm struggling with the the three young people, the next generation of Monarch, if you will. Um, it's there's a very young adult novel slash film sort of vibe to their story that kind of irritates. There's like this their 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 relationships, their dynamic is just very immature. And it doesn't really click with me. But then I'm a middle-aged guy who, you know, has grown beyond, one would hope, has grown beyond such petty relationships, squabbles, what have you. It's, um, it, it grates. It grates. I'll be, I'll be honest, it grates on my last nerve. But um, apart from that, yeah, I'm finding a lot to enjoy about Monarch. Ooh. People are starting to jump in. Oh, dude, yeah, that long scene. I forgot all about that. Yeah, that was really that was in the early days of those single take shots right and they've since evolved into i mean i know there's a lot of editing that goes on with some of these i keep thinking of like 1917 that was great and i know that it wasn't all one take but the editing that made it so seamless was really remarkable Oh, yeah, definitely. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, Gina. The most recent episode really dragged me back in. I was on the cusp of walking away. In fact, I didn't watch the last five minutes of the previous episode until making the decision to watch the latest episode. So, um, so yeah, it's it's definitely... It's a roller coaster ride, this one, isn't it? But then I guess all good monster movies should be roller coaster rides to one extent or another. I hope my voice lasts long enough for this. I'm feeling... My voice is feeling really weak today. Who am I missing? Steve131 showed up. Good to see you. Everybody's just saying hi to each other. That's fine. I wish I had more to entertain you with, guys. I really do. Um, maybe we should uh, familiarize you with some of JP Mavinga's stuff because I did, in fact, bring up his... Um... Oops, that's not how you do it. Still learning this whole StreamYard thing. It's not, it's not intuitive enough for me to... Um for me to uh, really pick up on it that quick. There we go, share that, there we go. And there we go, Are we are looking at John Paul Mavinga's website. So, what can we pull up here? He's got a lot of good stuff, but like just, just by way of example, that looks to be an actual painting. Wow, that's adorable. There we go, this is more the Mavinga I know and love. But just look at everything going on there. It's just so good, right? Yeah, mavinga.com is where it's at. If you want to actually break, a, uh, put a window open in your own browser and take a look at it while we're um, while we're talking to him. Oh, I love that one. I love the colors in that one so so very much. In fact, that might have inspired the color choices that I made in the thumbnail, to at least to an extent. What else? What also inspired the, those color choices was Thanos. But. Um, yeah, let's go down to some of his actual ballpoint pen stuff. I've got a sketchbook by him. 
that I just purchased. He does have orderable things. He's done some work for DC Comics. Just go ahead and come back to this and uh, bring that back down. Cool. But yeah, sketchbook. Little floppy sketchbook. But it's just, I just love everything that this guy does. Seriously. I mean, come on. There's a mood to most of his pieces that, um, and I think that, I think a lot of times when I, like this one of the, of the cyborg girl just sitting on an outcropping, I, I can see JP doing that. But what he's really, what he's really good at, first of all, hands, hands and hands and hands, hands are hard. But what he's really good at is, um, is tech and engineering. Um, I actually have, he had, I, I have on my desk, one, two, three, four, five, five statues. And he had his hands on at least three of them. Mostly the bases, and I'm talking about the, um, like the bases for the Boba Fett uh, and uh, Stormtrooper Mythos um, figures that I had. Not Mythos, the Macquarie line of uh, fifth scale statues that Sideshow did. But I've got the Boba Fett and the, um, the Stormtrooper right here on my desk. And he designed the bases for them. I'm trying to see if I can squeeze at least one of them out for you to take a look at. Whoa. That is some dust, my friends. I am just filthy. Let's see here. All right, I'm just gonna show off my dust. Don't fall, don't fall, don't fall. Arr. So this base, dusty as it is, was uh, designed by JP. And if you, you can just see it. If you're at all from, look at how that, look at how that's like got sort of a Millennium Falcon cockpit vibe going to it. I just love that. And it's very much in line with the stuff that I just showed you in the sketchbook and on his website. And I love that. I think it's some, I think it's something that is, um, I would like to see more of that in collectibles. I know that he did some work with Tweeterhead, and I'm not sure exactly what, but we'll get to that when the time comes. What's this? What's this? Have you seen Britain's number one Star Wars collector, TK421, has branched out to Spider-Man? I did see that. I did see that. Welcome to the rabbit hole, man. Are you going to go all in? Are you going to go all in and just like get every Spider-Man figure? Don't do it. It's a trap. It's a trap. I would, if you would have come to me, I would have advised you to stay with Star Wars. But um, eh, it's your collection. Collect what you want. And not, and that's no slight on the Spider-Man figures. They're great. They're they're cool. And I would imagine that any collection that had the Spider-Man figures all in a row, the way that you do with your Star Wars figures, would look amazing. I myself only have one. I've got a few Star Wars. I've got a few Spider-Man figures, actually, now that I think about it. Yeah. And Spider-Man related figures like Mysterio and Mysterio's Iron Man Illusion. And yeah, but they really do run the gamut. They're very prolific, Hot Toys is, with putting those things out. <coughs> yeah, they're all cool, Laura. Um, I don't have the Vader. It's the only one from that line that I don't possess. Um, and it's fine. It's fine. It's fine in that Paul Sun Yun Lee way. I think the I think the Vader piece was the only one that I didn't fully appreciate. I, I was not a fan of the pose. But um these two are just choice. Yeah. You know, for the Vader, I think what I would like to have for for a Macquarie Vader representation would be one of the helmets by now by uh, originally um a Novos, I think, did one, but um Denuo Novo? think is what they're calling themselves now yeah I would if they're still doing that I think I remember seeing that that they were doing one but maybe I'm wrong does if I oh it does oh I have seen extraction too but I think that was one that I just really didn't pay that close of attention to while I was watching it <coughs> so I don't know maybe I'll have to watch it again maybe 
Hey, Luis, good to see you here. What's happening? I'm trying to see what that was about. Oh, yeah, okay. My God, I'm so tired. My God, I'm so tired. I don't know how I'm going to get through this stream. Oh, what else have I got here? You know, the boxes are still here from, uh, the box is still here from the Iron Man Mark 85 holographic thing that I did last week. Yeah, it's, um, I was busy this week. Did y'all see that Batman video? That took a minute. <laughs> that took a minute. I'm really happy with it. Um, all the more so because I just, I, you know, I'm not a, a colossally, I'm not a massive Batman fanatic. I appreciate Batman, and I've, I've, I have loved Batman in the past. I've loved versions of Batman. Um, I was reading Dark Knight Returns as it was released. In fact, I subscribed to it because I didn't live near a, I didn't live near a, a direct sales comic shop at the time. So I had to subscribe to it with DC. So it was actually shipped to my house, which means I didn't get first prints of any of them, actually. I think, I think my copy of number one was either third or fourth printing. Anyway, but yeah, that's cool. And um, let me see, where else was I going with this? Batman, yeah. Anyway, very cool figure. Um, stressful shoot because I was under the gun. Uh, they dropped, they dropped the bat bike early, I think, and. Um, and so I had to hurry. I had to hurry and do that. And then that kind of interrupted my Batman shoot. And then um, then I got in and did the Batman shoot on the day that it was released. And it was just not my best week. Not my best week. But I think that... Um, I think that it was worth taking my time. Um, I incorporated a couple new techniques that uh, Super Producer Sam um, sent me tutorials four months ago, and I just never implemented them until this until these videos. <coughs> but I'm really I'm really really happy with how it turned out, and I've been getting an insane amount of compliments on it. So for those who reached out, appreciate it. Um, even the team was highly complimentary of it. So yeah, I'm really really glad that um, that a lot of people seem to appreciate that video. I don't think there was one negative comment about it. Well, at least not in the comments. How was the Reva figure in hand? Really strong. Really strong. Really made me regret not ordering it. Um, I mean, a long time ago when they first started showing all of the Inquisitors, I thought to myself, dang, um, an Inquisitor shelf on a Detoff with Darth Vader in the middle would be so impressive. So impressive, and I, I really hope that um, that someday I have the means and the space to uh, to s to see that realized. And if not, I hope at least one person out there actually actually um, does that. Somebody in this group in my orbit does that and sends me a photo of it because I want to know how it looks. I do. I think it's amazing. Mike Games just joined us, by the way. For those of you who weren't paying attention, Mike, what's up, man? Sorry, just looking at your thumbnail. Admiring your shades. Uh, thanks. I'm at the direction of um, producer Michael. I did something that I was already planning on doing anyway. I adjusted my lighting. Um, I had added another light to the to the rig uh, relatively recently, and I just hadn't taken the time to fine tune it to, to finesse it. And I think I got pretty close with Reba. But I feel like I'm very, very close now as of as of the Bruce Wayne portrait on Batman. I, feel, I felt pretty good about that. So, uh, so yeah, continues to evolve. <laughs> that was a comment. That was a comment that I got a lot. Was um, was the uh, the narration for the Bat Cycle? I, it was very heavy on the. I, I was definitely flexing my motorcycle knowledge there. I don't know if Beskar Kid probably uh, probably noticed that. <laughs> mm. That is a great looking bike. Yeah, that Ducati front end, the 
the motor on that is legitimately it, it's it says that it's a v8 and it says that it's an eight cylinder but it's actually two bmw four cylinders slapped together so that's fun um obviously that swing arm that extended swing arm is just the swing arm itself is i don't know where it came from it's just bulky boxy whatever but um that's clearly hayabusa slash any pretty much any drag modified drag motorcycle influence because you're, if you're going to have an eight cylinder motor on a motorcycle that front end's going to come up so you've got to do what you can to control that um love the cafe style tank and seat on it the cafe racer style tank and seat i'm just everything about it was just a tip top design i want to say the guy that designed it also designed the batmobile from that film too which is that's my dream car that's my dream car gina b is being gina is being judged i will could never get into the batman character exactly exactly i was i was not a when i was a child i enjoyed aspects of the batman show but even then i was just like yeah this is campy and i don't like it and then then dark night then dark night returns happened and changed my world changed my batman world not my whole world but it did change a lot of how i saw comics that was i was really maturing at that point in my life and, and getting less into kitty things and more into more adult fare um a lot of the books that eventually became DC Vertigo books, I was reading those. Swamp, uh, Swamp Thing with, by Alan Moore and John Toddleman. And um, Hellblazer, you know, which was an offshoot of, the, um, of that book. Uh, what was the one? There was at least one that started out. Maybe I'm thinking of Swamp Thing. Because Swamp Thing did start out as just a regular DC title. And then when Vertigo became its own imprint, then they, uh, then they ported it over to that. Yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I think that that's just, maybe I'm just getting old. I would like to drive a Bugatti. I think the stress of owning a, a Bugatti would be too much on my tender heart. Yeah, just the, um, the upkeep on it, um, the, um, the insurance for it. Yeah, I mean, that's like a, yeah, I just won a billion dollar Powerball kind of a car then maybe I could see it and not even stress about it. Yeah, sure. 16 year old stranger, take the keys to my Bugatti and have fun. Uh, that helped. The thing about the 89 Keaton film was it attempted to, to keep, to have the best of both worlds. If that makes sense, um, you got the campiness of the of the '60s Batman TV show, but it was really heavily layered with the dark aspects of the Frank Miller world, and that was cool for its time. But I think we've had a lot better fare since then. And I'm yes, I am talking about Christopher Nolan, uh, the new version. <clears throat> that was good too. Weird though that I I saw it and thought, ah. Oh, yeah, that was amazing. But I've I've attempted to watch it again at least once, maybe twice, and I've not been able to get all the way through it a second time. It's like once you know what happens in that one, it loses a lot. If I felt like it lost a lot for me. But I don't know. That may it may have I'm frequently a fan of saying, you know, to somebody, including myself, when they just when I respond negatively to something, I'm like, okay. What's going on in your life right now? Because it's always possible that whatever's happening in your life may have influenced your experience with a movie, with a six scale figure, a uh, book. Yeah, I mean, distractions happen. Distractions happen. I remember seeing Terminator Salvation for the first time in theaters. I went by myself. Um, and I've been out partying hard the night before. But when it got to the point where Schwarzenegger showed up on screen, something about that just triggered me. And I just got up and walked out of the theater. Just got up and walked out. Um, I never saw it again in, 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 in theaters, but when it came out on video, I just bought it. 
because back in the night, what was the nineties, late nineties, early aughts, whenever that was, that's what I did. Impulse buys were my thing. And, um, loved it. Loved it. That's, that's, it was the second viewing. It was sometime after the second viewing that I recognized the Frankenstein aspects of, of what was going on with, uh, with, with the main character. And I really learned how to appreciate it. But I don't, I don't know, man. I mean, that was just so unchar uncharacteristic of me. Hmm. No? Yeah. No? You've always got to... Keaton. Hmm. And that's fine. I feel like, um... I feel like with, like with most things. Do you remember that deleted scene from, um, Pulp Fiction? Where, um, what's her name is asking uh, John Travolta's character, are you a Beatles man or, a, or an Elvis man? And she points out that you can, you can like both Elvis and the Beatles, but you can't like them both equally. And asking that question is basically a way of getting to know that person. It's the, whoever, however that person answers that question, that says a little bit about them. It tells you a little bit about who they are as a person. So you may be able to do that and, you know, Pay attention, those of you who are, you know, maybe getting back into the dating scene. This could be a very good first date question. But uh, your favorite Batman might tell somebody, your answer to that question might actually uh, tell something about yourself to the person you're talking to. <laughs> I knew it was going to be bad. Had to see how bad it was. I accepted it was silly camp. I liked it more than Batman forever. I don't remember which one of those I preferred. Batman and Robin or Batman forever. Um... Probably Batman Forever. I liked Val Kilmer as Batman. I thought he was I thought he was a cool Bruce Wayne. Um, but again, I think that I think at that point they were focusing on the star power of the guy playing Batman as opposed to whether or not he would really, really be the character. You know what I mean? Definitely the case with uh, with Clooney, but well, I think maybe it was not you having a hard time rewatching the Batman. I have the same with the Batman and Joaquin Phoenix Joker movie. My theory is that are both heavy mood based films. That's that's a good theory. That's a good theory. There, it there's a film can potentially be too dark for a rewatch. Can, yeah, and I think that's definitely the case with the the Joker movie. Although I did watch that one twice because there were aspects of it that I just needed to see again more in order to better understand it. Uh, but, um, yeah, I don't know why I can't get through the Batman a second time. There were some cool, sp there were some cool parts in there. I, the, uh, the reveal of the, of the Batmobile, the chase scene with, uh, with, with the penguin and, uh, and all that, that was just beautifully shot. And I would, I would at least love to watch that again. I have a friend who absolutely can't stand the Nolan Batman, but then he has a very specific idea of what Batman should be, maybe too specific. There you go. Too specific is very much... Yeah, you gotta open yourself up, you know, to other interpretations. You can't just be that fucking militant about what something should be. Um, first of all, it's not your sandbox. So, I mean... I'm gonna, I'm gonna start. I'm, I'm, if I'm not careful, I'm gonna go into territory that I don't want to go into today because it's just too. I'm, I'm not. I'm sensing that my filter isn't where it should be. I have to adjust my filter settings. Bitter Troll liked Kilmer. Yeah. And we got Dark Batman with Nolan. Um, and that's you know again the Batman I. I think that the Batman might just be my favorite interpretation of the Batman of the Gotham world of Gotham City. Um, I don't know. It's been a long time since I watched the Nolan Batman, which again, I, I can't remember if I said it earlier in the conversation, definitely my favorite Batman. Um, oh, there's another, there's another take. So I figured out what to do now. If the channel's being quiet, if the, if the chat's being quiet, just bring up Batman. That bring, Batman brings all the chatters to the yard. 
Bad Wolf Media decided to join us today. Thank you, Bad Wolf. What's up, Mike? <coughs> it is an ode to incels. And I think a lot of people picked didn't pick up on that, especially incels. <laughs> it's not an ode to. It's definitely um, a critique of the incel world. And, um, and yeah, I, I think, uh, I, I think that, uh, the people who most needed to recognize that did not, did not. In fact, they embraced it. <laughs> it had the opposite effect. Patrick, thank you very much. Very kind of you. Very kind of you. Okay, that's what I was looking for. Yeah, Mike Games brought up Kevin Conroy. And that's not a Batman that I often think about. It's not, I, because I, I totally missed that. I missed the entirety of the DC animated era. Didn't watch Batman. I watched some of Batman um, of um, Batman Beyond and enjoyed that immensely. I just thought that was a lot of fun. Um, but, yeah, no, I did not, uh, I did not watch more than one or two episodes of the Kevin Conroy Batman. In fact, I tried to engage with it relatively recently. I think just since I moved back to St. Louis and um, I just got distracted. There were so, there's so much new content going on right now that making the commitment to go back and watch a monster epic saga like the animated Batman from beginning to end, which would then probably lead into a watch of Batman Beyond, which would then lead into Superman, Justice League, um, all the others. I don't have that kind of time. I don't have that kind of time. Maybe if I budgeted my time better, I would. But um, as of right now, I can't do that. Bad Wolf, Bad Wolf. I'm late to this fight, but I'll rock the boat too. Christopher Nolan made stunning action drama movies and they're... Are they really lousy? Be careful of your word choices, oh journalist. Um, beware, of, beware of extremes. Uh, they are indeed making a Joker sequel. It stars Lady Gaga as Harley Quinn. Also known as my former partner in flirting. She flirts so well. It's not like flirting with intent. It's like that casual flirting where you're just kind of poking, where, you know, she's just kind of poking fun of you, you know, a little bit. She's got, she's got a neat, Lady Gaga's got a neat demeanor about her. I, 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 I miss running into her. She was fun. I've seen parts of the Batman over and over, but probably the whole thing maybe twice. Okay. Yeah, I, I really need to make the time to watch it again. What's going on here? Okay. Making sure I didn't miss anything from JP. Love the Nolan movies. I perfectly love... Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, Affleck was great as... You know, he's, he's great at both. Both, both being um, I'm, and, and by both I mean both by at both at being Batman and at being Bruce Wayne. Um, although I don't think that there was much of a difference. I think my favorite. That's one of the things that I like most. Like most about the uh, the Nolan films was that you could see a marked difference between the character of Bruce Wayne as portrayed by Bateman. Bateman. Bale. <laughs> Jason Bateman is Batman. Imagine that, will you? <laughs> no disrespect, Mr. Bateman. You're a very fine actor, and I've enjoyed a lot of your work. But please, please, don't don't be Batman. Don't be Batman. Um, but yeah, he. I mean, I don't think anybody did a better job of playing Bruce Wayne publicly, where he's supposed to be just this trust fund baby obnoxiously entitled and yeah then uh, then Christian Bale did seriously I would love to hear challenges to that if somebody else thinks that there's somebody else out there who did it better then I would love to hear it <sighs> that's so strong right the Batmobile are... please hot toys please hot toys 
by the way, I have a while we're talking about Batman, I will I'll just go ahead and say this. I am um, I have long avoided back in the day I got myself a tumbler, the original. And I had no place to put it. And it was causing friction between me and my then wife. And um and I gave it to a friend. Just straight up gave it to a friend who was having a bad time. He was in he was in the middle of a bad bad thing. And I was just like, yeah, you can use this more than I can. And then later on, I, I last year I I got another one and um, gave it to another friend, Scott Heinemeyer, if you're here. No, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Loved it. And now I've got another one coming my way. So I, I guess that I'm sending a message to myself. That message would be maybe clear off all the books on one of those shelves and put a tumbler in it. I think that's what's going to happen. Yeah, I think so. I think this shelving unit back here is just going to become all collectibles because I do have some stuff that needs to be displayed. And just having those books there is kind of like a break from the theme. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'm going to put uh, I'm going to put the the tumbler there if it'll fit. It may be too tall. It's kind of tall. And I think I'm going to put um, the bat pod down below it along with totally breaking the theme but along with the um, Tron cycle pretty sure that the um, none of the speeder bikes or swoop bikes or anything will fit on that shelf those display stands that they're on are a little bit tall right anyway I'm, I'm rambling which is never good content wow going for the classic didn't see that coming okay Probably the only take on Batman is similar to the very first movie. He talks about getting to a point that he can stop being Batman. That's it. Is it? I don't know. I, I disagree that there is... That may be antithetical to, um, to historical takes on Batman. But maybe not to this version of the Batman. I, there's, there's room for it all, dudes. I mean, seriously. I've talked about this with Star Wars. I've talked about it with the Marvel movies. I to, now I'm going to talk about it now with the Batman. I mean, there's there's room for multiple takes. There's a whole multiverse of stuff that happened in the in the in the comic books. Um, I give you metal, Dark Knight's metal, man. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it, there's room for all of it. I mean, it's and it's it's been that's a theme that has happened since the birth of mythology. Stories come into being to explain things or to understand things. Yeah. Yeah, I'll back that. I'll back that up. I feel the way I want to express is how they feel about a certain Batman says more about them than which specific Batman they like more. Yeah, I think isn't did I not just say that? If the, if I didn't say that, that's what I was trying to say. About ten minutes ago, maybe you tuned out for that bit, but um, but yeah, that's a hundred percent how I feel. It's it's legitimately a Rorschach test of sorts. Your answer to that question might might reveal something about you as a person, and that's not to say it's something good or bad because it's all freaking subjective. It's just I I, I will learn something about your tastes, not whether you have good or bad tastes. I'm not going to judge, but. Clearly, I'll learn. I will definitely learn something about you as a person by based on your answer to that. You clear? I love the Nolan films, but they are not. No need to clarify. That's cool. In the Batman, I love the chemistry between Bats and Commissioner Gordon. Yeah, that was really good, right? It was such a great relationship, and I think that's um. That's also down to the fact that those were two really, really strong actors working in cinema today, interacting with each other. I mean, Robert Pattinson, before he was cast at the Batman, I would not have given him the time of day just because of my visceral, I don't want to say disdain, but I, I just, I have no use for the Twilight films. And until he was cast as the Batman, I was legitimately ostracizing him and his work from my my media consumption so 
after he was cast as the Batman, that's when I started actually exploring his his body of work. That's when I went out and watched The Lighthouse, for instance, with, um... I hate not remembering stuff. Um... Starts with the D... Defoe. William Defoe. William Defoe. William Defoe. Um, yeah, great, great film if you haven't seen it. Super, super dark. Loved it, but yeah. Uh, McFarlane's Batman? McFarlane's Batman. Who's that? Are you talking about Todd McFarlane? What am I missing? Am I going to be embarrassed by this later? I probably am. I frequently am. Big Dog Pound, the Notorious BDP. Actually, I saw that you showed up earlier, but I was talking about something else. Hot Toys really outdid themselves with the newly released Battison and Signal. It's really, really strong. I'd show it to you, but I've put it away already. Because I had to get moving on another video yesterday, so. This song really has a Halo vibe, and it, it's, yeah. It hits me. Okay, yeah, that's actually... I remember when that came out on video and I almost picked it up off the shelf at Target. Ben Affleck should have become the Batman for Generation 2, but like Henry Cavill, you'll settle the stories that were problematic. I agree. To, I'll have to disagree with that one. I, again, I don't think that Henry Cavill's stories were problematic at all. Um, I mean, I think Justice League suffered from filmmaking by committee. Yeah. But, um, and I, I know that, I know that the, I, I don't really pay too much attention to the, um, Snyder Bros at all. I don't like to pay attention to bros, period. But, um, it's, um, I do share their appreciation for the Snyder films, um, I would like to have seen where he was going to go if he'd been allowed to continue what he wanted to do. And, it, you know, it's just too bad that didn't happen. They could have let that end. They could have let him finish that and then moved on to something else. I'm really excited to see what James Gunn is going to do. My fellow St. Louisan, who somebody saw a picture of me recently and thought it was James Gunn. Which one was it? I'll bring it up. Boom. Wow, there we go. Just going to make sure that there's nothing incriminating. Oh, there we go. Is everybody looking at that? Here we go. <laughs> that is so not James Gunn. <laughs> anyway. Snarky Jason Beacon and his Alfred? Maybe in a few years? He's not getting any younger. Which of us is? But yeah. That could be fun. Still not sold on Hano. What is Hano? Hono. Is that legitimately a Hot Toys company? I haven't, I haven't really explored it that much. Um... But I appreciate it. I welcome them. I have a Tumblr problem. I'm not a Tumblr holic. I just have a Tumblr problem. In that I don't have room for a Tumblr. <coughs> Dude, it's so big. It's just so big. They all came down the pipe at once. I mean, I like when I like back in the day. I had the um, when I got my bat pod. Uh, Tumblr and the Batman figure like all came within like a week or two or three of each other and <sighs> legitimately the only place that I could store it was um, it was a coffee table that was it thank you Kumar thank you very much hope hot toys complete release in the Joe's Justin will be on the list yeah that would be fun it's a great looking Batmobile I mean it's my new fave is definitely the Batmobile from the Batman, but that's much like what Bad Wolf Mike is saying. Um, the way that uh, he feels that the Nolan films aren't really Batman films. 
this the Batmobile in the Batman is such a departure from historically what the Batmobile looks like that it's it's kind of hard to reconcile it. But I love that what I love about it is that it's clearly something you know, what you know always raises the question when um when Bruce Wayne was getting all these Batmobiles and, and costumes and everything built for him, how, how come nobody talked? There's only so much silence you can buy. And then somebody just caves. So it, it's it makes sense to me. The Batman's vehicles make sense to me because it would legitimately be something that he would have learned over time how to do himself. He would have educated himself, watched a lot of YouTube videos, and just learned how to customize, to build the motorcycle that he needed. That super fast machine that can outrun anything. Unless there's a lot of corners. <laughs> that bike's not cornering well. Yeah, man, I always do the bend. Yeah, had to look at the swoop bike just to make sure I wasn't lying to you, but yeah. Yeah, that's got the classic vibe to it. Um, and I think it set the tone for so many other versions of the Batmobile. And I'm, I'm talking about the um, uh, Kevin's Batmo Batmobile all the way through the uh, the animated series. Um, obviously, all the way through the four 90s movies. But uh, 80s. I guess there were only three 90s movies. One was 89, but whatever. It's a matte black Maserati with IR headlights and Batman uses night vision. Oh, Nightfall and Vision. I'm trying to remember. There was actually one where he was very clearly using a... I can't remember. I think it was during the um, the Morrison years in the comic book where his... I saw the Batmobile and I was like, that's a Corvette. <laughs> It was either a Corvette or a Cadillac XLR. And I can't remember which one. It might have been the Cadillac version because that does have more of a Batmobile sort of vibe. I don't think they made too many of those. Could be wrong. Going on one, I need to start looking for my guest. <clears throat> Make sure he's not messaging me. No, not yet. Okay, cool. Ah. Learn how to do tabs, Terry. Movies are a different reality than comics. Batman can be bats forever in the comics. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of welcome that there was a that it, that it came full circle. That they had an ending, um, and I kind of like how they left it open to interpretation. Like, was Alfred seeing him, or was he seeing a vision? Um, choose your own adventure, sort of a thing. Oh, somebody left a comment on my... The most watched video on this channel is the one about the Mandalorian helmet and EFX collectibles. Some, and, and I've had this question before, but somebody named Alex-OT4TM says, where is the unboxing? See, here's the thing about the EFX helmet and about the, um, and about the uh, Novos helmet. There's nothing to unbox. It, it, it's legitimately, when I start the video, it's like the, the, the helmets are already out of the box. And the reason for that is because it's just boxes. There's like nothing, there's no accessories, there's nothing you have to assemble. You pull the helmet out, you put it on a table, and it's done. I didn't do the, I didn't show the box because they weren't all that pretty. In fact, I think the Inovos one was just cardboard. Nothing to it at all. So I didn't bother with the boxes. That's just, it's, people are just so freaking weird. Yeah. I almost didn't do a live stream today just because I needed a break from people. But you guys are my people, so. Jesse Whitmer, I love all the bat people, but I definitely have my favorites and least favorites. That's fair. I have not seen Good Time. Mm, Tenant, I definitely saw. Yeah, definitely. And I need to see it again. 
Yeah, that was that was definitely what I was thinking. I almost said before I finally clicked on Defoe, I almost um I almost said the Green Goblin, but Yeah. Yeah, I would imagine he hates that. Sometimes I think, oh, he must really, really hate that. But then I imagine when he does, he probably just looks at his bank account and he's fine again. Yeah. I have high hopes for Christensen, Christensen now that he's um, now that he's back, so to speak. We'll see where that goes. Exactly. Exactamundo. He did Batman Year Two. I have that somewhere. I don't remember it being him though. No, no. You know the rules. The hair stays until I sign the divorce papers. Then I shave my head and donate the hair to a charity that makes wigs for cancer patients. That's how this goes. I guess. Third time's a charm, right? Third time's a charm. Anyway, it's 11 o'clock. That means we probably have a special guest somewhere. Um, we'll have to catch up with some of the uh, comments. But uh, I'm going to have to throw in some headphones. And we're going to have to kill the music because the last thing we need is for um, me and JP to drown each other out. Feedback is a real thing. So, um, it is my immense pleasure to welcome to this channel um, the second in a hopefully continuing series of guests uh, in the form of my friend JP Mavinga. What's going on, JP? Hey, hey what's up? Is. Wow, look at you, man! You're looking, yeah. really, you're looking distinguished. Younger? Yeah, you actually, you, you actually kind of look a little bit younger, except for you're getting a little bit of you're, you're copying my gray hair and the beard kind of thing going on right there. See that? Oh yeah, it's yeah. been the uh, post-pandemic grays. Is that what we're calling it? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I got to blame something. <laughs> okay, all right. You can blame me if you want, but or you could. But I'm, you know, we never see each other anymore. So maybe it's the lack of me in your life. No, I know, right? We we had some good times. We did, we did, we really did. Um, it was always, uh, I was always, I was always happy to see you show up to see your your shadow darken my door. <laughs> um, when you, when I was, when I had my office there at Sideshow, it was always just a sign that there was going to be some interesting conversation coming down the pipe. Um, which, uh, I, I don't want to say sh con good conversation is in short supply in my life, but, um, but some conversations <laughs> are better. Some conversations are better than others. And knowing that I was going to be hanging out with you was always a sign of good things to come. Um, so I felt the same way. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, man. But uh, yeah, you've been um, just give just let, let's catch people up a little bit here. I did bring it up a little bit earlier in the uh, in the stream, but just to catch people up who may have joined us late, uh, JP and I met when uh, we were both working uh, full time for Sideshow. I want to say that we were hired roughly at about the same time. Um, I think I had like a month or so on you, and then oh, you you twenty fourteen too. I believe. Let's see, maybe not. I think I was twenty thirteen. Yeah, you, you were, it seemed like you were there a while, but I don't think I even met you the first six or seven months because I, I didn't go nah. anywhere in that area until I don't even know why somebody told me to go get something. And then I, I saw people taking photos and I was like, oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of worthwhile, right? Yeah, yeah. You were like you were like, like this enigma. Actually, the um, I think for me, the design team was. Because that used to be when I first started working for Sideshow Freelance, I'd go there one or two times a week and um, and hang out in what was at the time the design wing of the building. And um, yeah. so I was it kind of felt like home to me to an extent going back into that wing because I was that was my inoculation into Sideshow was being surrounded by all the great designs because I was working for IP at the time. And and just um for me, that was the, the design department was, the most exciting 
part of the process for me um, because it was just, it's raw imagination being yeah. given its early form. And, and from there, obviously, once you finalize that design, then it moves into a completely different department where the, where it becomes physically realized and then evolves over time until the final product that winds up in people's mail. Um, yeah. But... I mean, people talk about the, the product a lot, you know, the, the, the incarnation, be it six scale or statues or whatever, but I feel like not, not to uh, take it off course, but like the true product is the story, right? And in a way it's, it's, it's birthed in design, obviously mm -hmm. derivatives of, of whatever the other media was, but um, the whole thing is story, you know, and, and in a way without that, you kind of just have resin or plastic to display, you know, it's, it's. And you yeah. can, and you can see that in the final product from, from various companies or even within the same company from project to project, I think. Um, yeah. The, when, when the story isn't there, then I, I feel like it actually shows up in the final product. Does. Yeah, definitely. Does. Yeah. So that's that's an interesting point. Yeah, I mean that's you know in in part we're talking about you know how we really met. It's like in the in the entire facility, you know, everybody's obviously you know got different jobs that they're doing. In design, we're you know we're drawing, creating you know ideas or whatever. Yeah. The only other place that I saw that was when you were posing things. Okay. Right? Yeah. So everything else is pretty much a reaction to what's been done. And you kind of walk by there and, and, and it's like, oh, there's a little scene going on in there with some kind of like fake smoke or whatever it is you were doing. <laughs> and I'm like, can smoke. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and for somebody like me, like I'm not, a, I'm not really a, I'm not a collector. You know, I, I just, I had a life where, you know, we just traveled so much. You just didn't bring a lot of stuff with you. The idea of collecting was like, it's not going to happen. Kind so I, yeah, you know, I, just, I never had a sense of like, what what do people do with this stuff, you know? And, you know, seeing it like that, I was like, oh, well, you you really would capture movie moments in the studio and photograph them and, and tell these stories. And, you know, the I think the one that um, I distinctly remember, uh, it was, it was, there's one I, I can't figure out which character it was. I just remember the, the color scheme. Okay. But like the one I remember was the, uh, there was the clones. It was a bunch of clones fighting the droids, you know, and it was a very kind of vertical composition. Yes. Yeah. And I remember talking about that and being like, okay, like, wow, like, you know, and, and at that point I'm, I was thinking about a uh, Drew Struzan and I'm like, man, if you just did this and wow. that, like you would capture the, the, you know, the movie poster. Cause it's always like different light sources. Mm -hmm. I'm but, just yeah. going to, uh, really quick here because i i have actually found that image um oh yeah yeah so let's uh that's i'm just learning i'm still learning how to use this um this particular uh streaming service so but yeah let's go ahead and pull that up is i'm thinking this is the one you meant yes yeah, yes okay. yeah. that's the one um that one yeah. just really stood out and i was like okay I yeah, see. Echo yeah. in fives. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, that wow. was um it, what we're talking about here is I mean the way that I've um the way that I've vocalized it is um that the thing about six scale figure collecting or any sort of posable figure collecting um is that it's the one at least within the sideshow universe, um, the, the, what differentiates six scale collecting from say statue collecting in general or um prop collecting, what have you is that uh, it leaves the collector as having the final say in the creative process. So mm -hmm. you're, given, um, you're given these raw materials in the form of these six scale figures to, um, and then for, with, those, with, with, that raw, with those raw materials, you're then able to tell your own story yeah. and tell it your way without anybody you know, dictating to you. You know, let me get that off the screen there. But um, but yeah, if that's I don't know, I'm not sure if I'm making sense or if I'm just being. Oh wait, lost you. You're back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it's it's true, and and you know I 
I remember hearing about the six scale product uh, when I was at McFarland. And um, somebody's trying to explain it to me because I had I'd never seen one, you know. Hmm. And I was like, an action figure? And, like, and I was like, Fab. you know, and then once I saw one, I was like, oh, okay, like this is, you know, somewhere between photography and uh, uh, what's the thing? Claymation? We, we yes. Kind of like for, um, uh, stop motion. Stop motion. Yeah. yeah, you know, and uh, I was like, okay, like this is. Um, it's amazing because also I got to work on um, some Iron Man uh, statues with Sideshow. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, so part of that research was like, well, here's the the six scale. It's so good. Oh, you yeah, probably yeah, yeah. like, you know, figure certain things out from it. And it's like, oh wow, okay. You know, you, you could watch the movie, but. You, you didn't have like an asset to turn in hand, you know, but the six scale you could. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think that was limited to Iron Man either. I think there were a few other um, uh, pieces yeah. that, uh, that um, hot toys figures were, were used for as reference. I mean, I don't want to delve too deeply into that and NDAs being what they are, but, um, right. but yeah, I, um, it's, um, it's, it's really, it's as a six scale fan, one of the things that I genuinely appreciate about them is that is the continued evolution everything seems to be moving forward. Uh, Hot Toys especially seems they're not content to rest on their laurels. They, they, they're, they're passionate enough about the art of six scale figures that they, you know, they don't need say trollish YouTubers pointing out things that they could have done better (laughs) because I think that they're, I think that they're all, they're all very much aware of where there's, where there can be improvement. And at a guess, and I don't have a great history in production, at a guess, I would say that like 10 years ago, perhaps they were limited by the technology of the time or the manufacturing technology of the time. And since then, there have probably been some developments in um, not just the means of manufacturing, but also in plastics development, Yeah, um, the engineering of, of, of different types of plastics, um, definitely in terms of uh, the materials for the soft goods components of, uh, of six scale figures. We've seen a lot evolve, especially, you know, I look at things like the Spider-Man suits and they're er, like earlier incarnations of the Spider-Man suits. The, uh, the, the material would flex and it just didn't want to have to go back. There was, there was not a lot of elasticity to it. Uh, but that seems to be less of a problem. I, I legitimately, there was a figure I was working with relatively recently, and it's a new figure, and I don't want to—I don't want to reveal it here. But um, the the support that I used with it left an indentation in the costume uh, within minutes after having it on the support. And when I removed it, I was like, "Okay, that's going to leave a mark." I walked away. I came back an hour later. That dent had disappeared. So there's th- that would not have happened, um, say, a decade ago. It's been so that's it's really cool to recognize that there's an element of of hot toys that's not only that's it seems to me there's there is an element of hot toys that is actively going out and seeking new materials and new ways of doing things. And I think that that's where the success lies. It's it's not in, say, creating a really awesome prototype. It's in because the proof is definitely in the pudding, as they say. So, yeah. I, yeah, so I noticed you have, because we're both car guys, uh, I love bikes and all that kind of stuff. And I was listening to uh, something with, I think it was Elon. Hopefully that doesn't make this political. No. But, you know, you were talking about the difference between making a prototype and mass product. And it's like, you know, most of, I think I made this analogy with friends, like, you can buy a million dollar Ferrari, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And hey, it's it's a lot of handmade. There's not many, you know, limited edition or whatever, right? But if you were to try to make a Honda Civic by yourself, it would cost you more than a million dollars, right? Yeah. And the yeah. only reason that the Honda Civic gets to 30 grand is because there's a two, three, five billion dollar production line yeah. to get it to that point. And you got to do a lot of homework, including material science to get to get it like that, you know, Mm -hmm. and um, 
before before any kind of like comics toys or geekery like i wanted to be a car designer at one point like i was you know you know really really into that and uh it i remember shows. uh also being into bikes a little bit not like you though but uh yeah. i used to get like cycle world and all that stuff bike magazine and um i remember this was going way back remember the the oval piston honda nr 750 yeah absolutely do yeah and uh that was, and i remember that was a fun bike yeah not, like, not that i know firsthand but yeah but, but design wise it was pretty so, thrilling you know how in Max and Day we sometimes have like these uh, these these like uh, projection like see through kind of drawings where they would show you like how the engine works, right? So it was like a it was like a V eight, but the, the the pistons were just merged together, mm-hmm. right? And then and then they were like opposing on the crank. It was like really really interesting, and I'm like, wow, like what what was the? I think it was like a they were trying to find this this equilibrium between the torque of V twins. And the horsepower of inline, yes, something like that. And uh, it was like, oh wow, this is. So, and then it just went away. And I was like, well, why? I yeah, I don't know. That, <laughs> I don't know that there was a lot of success um, that they really succeeded in those goals. I remember when that came out, reading the numbers, the horsepower numbers, the um, the quarter mile times, all that stuff. And yeah. the, the, while there may have been, I mean, don't get me wrong, it was a, it was a quick bike, but I and maybe. Because it was a super limited production run, if I'm not mistaken, they didn't make that many of them at all. I don't, I don't know if they they make them for the road. I thought it was just a track thing. I, I don't, I don't remember. Maybe they did. Yeah. I don't remember, but they did. I mean, it was offered for sale, but it was exorbitantly expensive, even even by the standards of the time, um, yeah, or even by the standards of today. It's, I mean, I still wouldn't want to drop that much money on a bike. So it's like I think what they ran into, and I'm not sure because again, I was so young, I didn't understand a lot of things. But like, you know, the the where the piston would interact with the with the block right okay like on a on a on a circular piston i imagine that the forces of friction is even all around so you know it's yes. easy to seal and cool that right right um but on an oval piston it's likely to be different and so you they probably ran into like a, a materials problem over time that like it's just not not necessarily solvable like it wouldn't have you know? longevity I think so. And like lately, this is getting really, really nerdy, but like I didn't even realize that like when they would engineer like combustion chambers, they would study like the flame front of how the fuel burns. And that would determine the shape on both the, the, the top of the piston and, and inside the, you know. That's fantastic. I, I would never have imagined that. But yeah, but once yeah, you say so, it out loud, you're, I'm, I'm like, okay, it, may, it makes sense. Because once you're up, like, you know, past five, you know, getting to 10,000 RPM and beyond, yeah. like, the, you know, a lot of, there's like a lot of fast forces you got to engineer for. So, like, they probably couldn't, just at that time, couldn't do it. Maybe they can now. But, like, as it relates to toys, it's like, you know, the first time that I got clued into, like, things were different was, like, you know, I remember talking to a plastics guy at McFarland who was a consultant, I guess. He would come in and they were, you know, talking about things that they had done in the, in the early days to get some of those details out of the mold and you know what that meant in terms of articulation and i'm sitting there listening to this which i i guess most designers weren't in that type of environment but they just kept bringing me to stuff you know okay and then you know um ed frank who's the president there was like basically showing me how it worked and so when i go to design he would tell me like okay remember this remember that remember that this is where you do your detail. This is where you do your function and like design for those. And I started like being able to understand how to use the constraints, you know, what big joint, ball joint, whatever it, to, to like, well, how do we get this look? Right. Yeah. And over time, I eventually, they even taught me like what it costs to do certain things. So this detail in paint costs this much. Okay. But if you sculpt it, you can go this way. And I started kind of realizing that, like, you know, there's this optimal relationship between design and engineering, where if you mesh those, you really get the best product that that you can. But it, it takes time, you know. And yeah, like, you'd have to. There's there's a there's a um, there's a sliding scale of knowledge between one and the other, and you have to like shift yourself. You know, you could yeah. go in there and you could have like the the like pure design 
um, experience, but like almost no edu- no knowledge of, it, of engineering. But the more you learn about the engineering process, then it, it enables it enables you to improve your designs. I've, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've seen Sometimes you, you just yeah. can't pull it off. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, got a question here from a friend of mine here in town. He's asking. <laughs> Um, I'm curious, does a nine to five office jo- type job environment really work for creative artists like yourself, especially when inspiration can be spontaneous? Um, gosh, as long as it's nine to nine, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do remember yeah. that you, um, you kept some, you kept different hours. Yeah, yeah I used to have to clock out together. at eleven fifty nine so that the system wouldn't like eject my. Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I've it, legitimately I mean, had a... moments like that working from home, where I was working at. Um, I realized that I was still working at one o'clock in the morning, and I hadn't clocked out. I'm like, oh god, now I got to send an email. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, honestly, like the way to answer that question is to say that it's not that it doesn't work for me. I just think that like what I am doesn't work for the corporate structure. There you go. Right. Cause I don't mm-hmm. think it's about me necessarily. Um, I always work more hours than I was scheduled to be paid for or whatever the case may be, you know, that's, that's simply a fact. And then, um, for usually people like us, it's like, you know, it, 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 I feel like, uh, what are those dogs that like, like you give them a scent and they go bloodhound. Yeah. Like I'm like that. You know what I mean? Okay. Like once once there's a problem, I'll I'll chase it down. Right? But I'm not gonna sniff around for nothing. Okay. And that's and that's kind of how it was. You know, once once the task was set, you know, I would go and solve it. And if it was doable within a certain time frame, I would do it. Um, and sometimes that was a lot of hours. But what what happens is that the I feel that the the, the corporate structure is designed for people that are not like us. Where it's like, okay, eight hours were worked checkbox, 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 checkbox. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, you know, if I give you 80 hours in two weeks, leave me alone. The fact of the matter is I can do 80 hours in, you know, less than a week. Yes. And, you know, and then, well, if you sit around for a week, oh, well, you know what I mean? It just disturbs that, that type of structure. So I think working from home or as a freelancer certainly has its advantages in terms of what's natural as a, as a flow. Um, but work life in America is structured around, you know, the corporate thing, you know, that's where all your extras come from. So, which, which doesn't, doesn't at all lend itself to the, um, well, like Keith says, the unpredictability of the creative process. Um, but, um, I, I don't know. I feel like there are some corporations out there that are, they they've probably been forced to make the transition into allowing what you described as basically just like oh as long as you get your eighty hours in then uh, then then we're good um, and as, yeah, long as, the pro- I mean, as long as the project is done too um, I, it's it's weird to me when I run into somebody in management who doesn't recognize the value of that or or who works to try to get you to conform to a particular type of structure. Yeah. So, I mean, one concession I'll make and coming from a leadership perspective, I've, I've, I've seen it from that side in the sense that like sometimes I guess you just need to be flexible. Sometimes you need your, 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 your dog or your whatever to like go solve it, you know, your engineer or whatever, like you don't disturb this person uh, and just leave them alone. Mm -hmm. But there are times when you need multiple minds at the same time. So then what time of day do you do that? You know, and the ideal sort of circadian compromise would be within the nine to five window. So at that point, it's like if you're if you're coordinating a team, then you probably want them, you know, at an optimum set of hours for everyone. Ideally, Um, most corporations probably won't do that from 5 p.m. to midnight, right? Right. Um, it's all, you, you, more's the pity. But... Yeah, I mean, people have families. And so, you know, I think that's the concession when you when you sort of uh, look at it from a leadership perspective is you, you want to create a situation that is doable for everyone and maybe no one's happy, but it's sustainable. So hmm. I get that. Yeah. 
for the record, um, circadian compromise is going to be the is going to be the name of my midlife crisis garage <laughs> band. Okay, I'm putting that at the top of the list. Then yes, there is a list. Yeah, but uh, yeah, good one, good one. That's a good question, though. It is. Yeah. You know? thank, yeah. Thanks, Keith. Yeah. Anybody else? If anybody else has any questions for JP, feel free to drop them into the chats, and I'll be sure to put them up there. Um, yeah, just a comment here, but uh, Bad Wolf is a uh, Bad Wolf Media. Uh, JP, this is this is Mike. Uh, he's a friend of mine that I met here on the channel, actually. And uh, hey, Mike. Uh, yeah, he. Uh, we go to a lot of concerts together. He's a photographer and journalist up in uh, Northern Illinois. But uh, yeah, he's um, he's. I guess in journalism, that's that's actually because I do have experience in journalism. I worked as a photojournalist for about seven, eight years more, if you count the time that I was doing it in high school. But um, the nature of the job is one that you're not going to be able to conform to um, to a nine to five structure. I mean, you have to go back. You go in at some point during the day and you get done what you have to get done during the day. But you can count on it that at night you're going to have to cover a city council meeting. You're going to have to go to a sporting event. You're going to have to go shoot a concert. Um, yeah, so it's, um, I guess it's, that's journalism is atypical, obviously. And that's probably why I gravitated towards it when I did, because I knew that, um, it has the sort of hectic lack of a structure that, um, that worked really, really well for me, especially given my ADHD nature. I mean, the, the, the nice thing about something like that is I can, I can focus on a particular task and I'll, I'll do this while I'm at home too. I'll, um, you know, I'll start, I'll start doing work on a particular project. Then I'll walk away from it for a little while while my subconscious works on solving a problem. And then, um, and then I'll come back to it or maybe in some cases force myself back to it a couple of hours later and continue it. Um, do you ever, does that, does that something that you ever do that you ever just have to, um, like find yourself just stuck or distracted and then have to, uh, have to bounce back to it or make yourself come back to it? Yeah, I try to have, um, at least two or three things that I'm working on mm. um, so that when I'm stuck, I can take a break and then do something else, do the other, you know, the other's tasks and come yeah. back to it kind of yeah. fresh. Um, but yeah, I, unless I see, you know, like the challenge with that is like, if I see it, then it's a matter of like putting it down and I really can't think about anything else. I don't want to think about anything else. It's kind of like it gets, gets obsessive. Um, hyper focus. I remember. Yeah. Like Voltron was like that. Um, you know, once I saw it, I remember I spent like, it had to be a week or two at, yeah. at home. Like that was the first time where I was like, I need I need to do this from somewhere from, from some other place, and I left the office. I mean, I would you know I would send in like you know my thing like you can email me or whatever, but like I would stay at home and I did these drawings and then brought them back, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it, it it was just because what we had was a a, a painting rough, you know, I yeah, and we didn't I really have like <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, Josh Nizzy did that beautiful yeah, piece, gorgeous. But we didn't really like like what is it, you know? Like he, he they hand it to a sculptor and was like, uh, I can't sculpt this. Like there was no, it was all like kind of noise. Okay. And so what I did was I, I I figured out like how each cat would be roughly constructed conceptually, and then how the cowling would fit. And it, I mean, we talked about this. It went back to the bikes. I was like, okay, well, you can always see like on you know on a racing bike or whatever, like a sport bike. You have the, the cowling over it, but you can see, you know, sometimes the engine and where you can certainly the exhaust coming out, you know, you can see the swing arm, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I was like, okay, I can see that being like a cat, but now you need to tell someone like, how does that work? And mm -hmm. so I started with, you know, an actual like lion, you know, where everything was, you know, and, and kind of like redrew it as tech. Um, you know, I had to uh, show the guy some bikes like, okay, well, you know, this this type of vent is is for cooling and this is an intake and like you know all these different kind of things but like if somebody doesn't know what that is like you have to draw it so i spent you know that That's time all. just doing all those drawings to make sure it matched that painting the initial one and that's so the, the painting there right is that the one you're talking about so what actually happened was once the statue existed mm -hmm. 
he was asked to go back and to finish or clean up the rough to look like the statue. Oh, right. Wow. So yeah, yeah, the, the, uh, I think those are two different, anyway, but yeah, yeah, the, the, the initial one that he did was very sketchy, very kit bash, you know, noise, but the one that was refined was based on the details that we determined in the studio, um, based on those drawings. Okay, so I'm so, thinking then the what the, what we're looking at here with the um the paintings is probably that the evolved version. I don't think this is the rough one that you de- that you described, if I'm not mistaken. But then I wasn't really paying yeah. too much attention to Sideshow's um art print program at the time. It was kind of new and um and hadn't quite found its footing yet. Unlike today. Yeah. 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 I remember when I when I saw the the revised one, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, like it's. But, you know, that was when I worked on that. I didn't really work on anything else for that, you know, little span of time. I, was that, that was your first project, right? Oh, no, no. No? That was, gosh, I was, I was at least six months in when that was going on wow. in-house. And I had been a freelancer for probably a little over six months already. Okay. So my first project was... um some type of Iron Man statue. Was it yeah. one of the uh, half scale ones or um, smaller? I, I'm not sure if it came out. That but does happen. <laughs> yeah, I know. I I, mean, I worked on several of them. One of them did come out. Um, uh, I think it's that Mark. I don't know which one actually, but it lights up, and it it came out probably 2019 something like that um, but yeah it, it took a while to come out and then i worked on some star wars stuff that i didn't think i don't think went anywhere but yeah i did a lot of work i did some terminator stuff that i don't think came out this is was, all before uh, i came in house i was showing off this guy earlier oh yeah <laughs> look familiar <laughs> yeah so like those so when i got on those like it had been started so like the figure and the poses were basically determined and, and the, the figures were, were Macquarie designs and the guy had roughed them a little bit. So I did a few touches to make, you know, certain things a little bit more sharp for the details so mm-hmm. the sculptor could read it. But then it was like, okay, we need like a base, you know? And yeah. what's and interesting is... It's very hmm? much your style. I mean, I, I look at this base and I just see it's, this is Mavinga. Um, especially yeah, well, that that's Star Wars here in the back, and I'm gonna I'm I'm making people nervous holding it this way, but th- I mean this <laughs> drop it. this I mean I can I can imagine your sketches your your drawings in my head um, that this is based on. I mean I can just see it, I'm, and I can see elements of it in in your other work that um, that's visible on the we- on the website. By the way, Mavinga.com is uh, is if you want to get a good look at uh, JP, so I'm gonna go ahead and put that up there in the uh, chats for people to uh, to go ahead and. Yeah, or yeah. or uh, IG probably has got more current stuff. Um, oh yeah, what's your yeah, IG? I need it. JP Mavinga, like one. Boom. There. Yeah, uh, I will have a new site soon, hopefully before the new year. But it's wow, just so yeah, so much work. I have a uh, yeah. People have been um, not to go off course, but like yeah, I've been trying to like connect more with with fans and people like that, and it's been really really cool. Um, I've been noticing. Yeah, the, the prints and all that. But like, actually, people hit me up for like originals. Um, so uh, I have like little bits of concept stuff that I've been selling to people, and um, so I want to open that one up. That, uh, this is a. You sent me an early version of this a yeah. while back. I can't remember how long ago it was. Like a year or so ago. Yeah, it was a year ago. Um, yeah. So I did one version that was like. Cause, you know, it's it's basically sorcerers from Masters of the Universe. If mm-hmm. I got to design it, yeah. Um, so I did one that was like very Masters of the Universe, like the castle in the background. And I was like, you know, let me just like take it to the fullest and like just drift away from the character and just like do me, you know. Mm-hmm. And then so I took that. And so a lot of people, when they see that, they think, oh, Phoenix Rising. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> for you. Yeah, <laughs> let them do it. That's totally fine. I've, I've also on the back on the flip side, I've got this guy. 
which is that yeah. Trapjaw? Is that his name? Or a... Yeah, that's Trapjaw. I was never um, much of a Motu guy. But uh, I but I've had this conversation. You remember um, Tim? Oh yeah, that was yeah. actually drawn for Tim initially. Was it? Yeah, he has the oh. original. Oh wow, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah he's um yeah I I always love talking to Tim. He's just such a friendly dude and um and so passionate about the things that he's passionate about. And one of the things that he's passionate about is Masters of the Universe. Yeah. And um and that's that's one thing. Masters of the Universe came along at a time when I was transitioning from child to young adult. Yeah. And at, th at that time, I was no longer really interested in the sort of medium that they told that story in. But in later years and, and knowing what I know about the characters and, um, and what I've seen in the figures, there was a part of my brain that just started thinking about what it would be like if instead of debuting as an animated series made primarily for children if it had been developed as more adult fare and yeah. i think that that was i was having those thoughts at the same time that i became aware of tim's fandom of masters of the universe and also at the same time that the conversation started happening where they were going to be doing that very thing with uh, with statues and selling them at sideshow and i think later on that became a thing for tweeterhead where and you've did some you've did some work for Tweeterhead if you're not still doing it now. I don't are you still involved with them at all? Not doing anything right now, but there's things that I did that haven't yet to come out, is my oh, understanding. Fine. All yeah. right. Yeah. To be continued. Yeah. There's I mean, some of the stuff I worked on came out like three, four years after I did it. Yeah. So that's the nature that's the nature of things and i think a lot of people don't realize just how long it takes to bring such things to fruition i mean yeah legitimately I mean, takes you... years so, <laughs> unless you're unless you're exo6 i'm not sure if you're familiar with exo6 no they're the six scale company that um burgeoning six scale company that uh, that just came out of nowhere and they're making it their five-year mission to release as many um six scale star trek figures as possible Oh, I yeah. like Star Trek. Yeah, you should <laughs> check them out because, not, and not just to check, not just to check out the product because, as you've said, you're not a collector. But I think more of interest to you would be the way that their that their that their leader has been able to streamline the whole process of. Well, I think it's primarily in production that he's been able to streamline the process, but it's it's remarkable, by and large, how quickly he's able to turn these figures around. Um, once the once the final prototype is finalized he's he's doing things differently and Absolutely. i don't want to get into it too much because again ndas but um but uh but you can monitor nanjing tam is his um is his name on instagram on facebook on all of them but he's very whereas most companies hold the kind of take the whole process of production and development and hold it close to the chest and don't talk about it keep it a secret he's very very forthcoming about it um in fact i i haven't i have imagined other companies like oh my god i can't believe he's talking about that you're telling them all our secrets you know it's <laughs> honestly man like it's it's just confidence i remember um one time having a conversation with a, a kind of an artist person who was very very worried about sharing how we do things with people because they would like you know out compete us or something like that and i was like on the surface it seems like a reasonable concern but what's your take on it it would be like me hiding the paint that i use <laughs> or how i apply paint yeah it, it's like i i want to see everybody's art but i have no concern of anybody being me because they're not going to come close you know, and at the point where they can, like, one, I'm not innovating. You know what I mean? Like, like, if somebody can copy me and get close, like, I'm not doing anything new with what I'm up to. And that's my problem. That's not their problem. Okay. Right. Yeah. And like, I, I feel the same way. And like, you can teach somebody how to write, you can teach them all the secrets of writing, they're not going to be Stephen King. Don't take that from right? you, JP. <laughs> Well, it's like true, maybe though. Terry Smith true. is yeah. better than Stephen King one day, right? I'm just saying, like, it, it's 
So when you have a company and you have processes and and and, and I feel this way about again Tesla, like okay, well here's our patents, like do you? But like the execution that that comes from that individual, that comes from that that leadership structure, right? You can have all the tools, but if you don't have the will and the discipline to do that thing, or exactly. frankly to do your own thing, it doesn't matter. And I feel like sharing just makes us all better, right? It makes us like. You know, I remember a conversation with someone at Sideshow, or not really a concept, but like an interaction where we were, you know, they were showing slides and it's like, you know, because because the competition. And this was somebody senior to me. And I, I just, I was like, I don't know, man. Like, I don't agree. I don't think there is a competition. I think there's only one, you know, at that time, you know, Sideshow, but there's only one Sideshow. And I think the only people we compete with is ourselves. Like, you do the next level of this. And in the licensing game, like you have that category anyway. So who's your competition? Right. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. you know, and so I, I, again, I'm not, I'm not afraid of that at all. I, I just think like we're for the stuff I do. I mean, we're all looking at Renaissance masters and, and everything that happened from then till now. Well, their world didn't get to where it was without a bunch of sharing. Right. It, it right. was, um, it was, it, there was a communal quality to it that, um, they, they built yeah. off of each other and they encouraged each other. Yes. But, okay. So if you go back and dive into some history now it's going to be rough to like, you know, people don't, don't quote me, don't hate me, but like, you know, the, the, the library of Alexandria was destroyed way back when, um, now, most of that stuff was destroyed, but what was recovered ended up in Baghdad, to my understanding. Okay. Right? And so this included like old, old maps, but a bunch of things about mathematics and geometry and so on and so forth, the stuff that was lost, right? Yeah. So over the years, you, you, the people who were the first kind of seafaring seafaring pirates that we think of were actually Islamic people because they were better navigators in part because of those maps and the mm -hmm. geometric knowledge. Yeah. Now the interaction <clears throat> by trade started happening in particular with Italy, because you can see that it's, it's sticking into the Mediterranean. Right. Okay. So now you had this interaction with commerce and mathematics, both the accounting, but also the geometry. Right. Yes. So this is talking like the, the 1300s into the 1400s. And it, it, it it makes sense that that geometry would manifest itself in art. Now you're doing perspective and projecting, you know? Okay. Yeah. And you had this kind of, <clears throat> I mean, the, 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 the Islamic cultures use it in different ways for what they were up to, but they also brought a lot of knowledge in terms of medicine that dated back to works from Alexandria and prior. Okay. Right? Yeah. So Alexandria, that library, had a continuity of work depending on what you believe and what you look into that goes back a thousand years but some people argue 10 times that and which, get, like, which would, which would make sense business. yeah i mean yeah the yeah. the people well, who destroyed the library were um <clears throat> you know yeah. Exactly. yeah but so that that interruption resumed with you know the Renaissance and all the curiosity and subsequent stuff that followed, well, all that trade and interaction just made everybody better, hmm. right? And yeah. So one artist took it to this level, the other artist took it to that level, and came back to that level, and came back to that level, and they were interacting with medicine and mathematics to to bring the art that we have today, where you have this this anatomical knowledge mm -hmm. brought together with the geometric knowledge, and then eventually material knowledge with Van Eyck. When they started using lenses and and projecting and photography and you know lights, yeah. So like, you, you bring all that together and you get this beautiful art, and it's like why, like, you know, what I mean? if if every studio kind of like, you what's, just don't get the growth. What and what you're what you're describing? I mean, this that sort of event, like what happened at the at the uh, Library of Alexandria, has happened in to every major civilization in every major part of the world 
that st- you know obviously still exists today. But you know it happened. It happened with I can't remember which dynasty it was in China where uh, there was a one, there was one point in time where China was at the pinnacle of um, of mathematics and education and science and um, and that was all brought down by a particular emperor. And um, of course, what you're describing also took place in the in the Middle East. I mean, they were legit. There's a reason why our 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 numbers are. Um, and geometry and everything it's it's all it all comes from from the arabic because that that's where it was all conceived and yeah it's so if, so when so when you wow. get people who when you get people who work actively work to suppress the sharing mm-hmm. of such a thing that's when progress can be brought to a halt yes and, and potentially everything can come tumbling down there's more to it than that but yeah go you go ahead you were saying yeah well so I used to think also that the math was conceived in that, you know, Islamic world, and it's not to take credit from them, but I think it was inherited. A lot of the things that we have are inherited, yeah. right? Like people talk about like, you know, Tesla and electric cars. Well, actually, if you go back to the origin of the automobile, they had electric cars back then. They just had no batteries. It just didn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So they already knew back then in the, in the early 1900s, like electric motors were better right? They just, they responded instantly and they had all the torque. Yes. It's just, you had no way of carrying the power. And less wear and tear, I mean. Less parts. And, and you know, even using um, a gas engine as a generator, gasoline engines back then were already so if inefficient. So now if you're, if you're doing that, like you, you just be carrying so much fuel, it's like, well, just use the, the kinetic energy in the engine and just go right to the wheels. Right. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. that's what we ended up with. So the idea that like Tesla originated, no, they didn't. It's inherited. And I think the mathematics is clearly inherited. Many things are inherited. And so, you know, this idea that again, all the manufacturing that goes on, like you're talking about production process, it's all inherited. For somebody to sit there and like hoard it, act like, oh, you know, gotta keep it secret. It's like. Yeah, and and you talked and you spoke earlier about how it's, um like in the case of sideshow, you know, like um, sideshows, sideshow, sideshow. I mean, their their only real competition, especially at the time, should be themselves. And um, I think that I think that again, the proof is we've seen so many companies, so many upstart companies that have have done this sort of thing. They've brought um, they've brought their money to the table. They've developed product. Um, they've pushed it through production. It's sold to varying degrees of success, but so many of those companies wound up failing. I mean, we've, we've seen, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't want to drop names, but there have been a lot of companies, especially over the course of the pandemic and in the year or two since the pandemic that, um, that have ultimately just, that ultimately just no longer exist. Mm-hmm. So, you know, even if you have the knowledge, it's no guarantee that you're going to make it. Knowledge to me is just the beginning of it. You have to have, um, what I would call institutional knowledge. Hmm. You know, when I came to to Sideshow or even McFarland, like in both instances, I could draw. It wasn't a question of whatever. Yeah. But um, I couldn't necessarily fully design the product. Now I was I was in a better position at Sideshow because I'd done that stuff before. Okay. But I didn't understand the material, like the final material. I didn't understand the roles of the people from the time the drawing left my desk to the time it was in a customer's hands. I didn't understand the people involved. Okay. And so it took Same. about six months to like start to, for it to start to make sense. And I think it took two years for me to become fully formed. And when I say fully formed, like there was an incident, um, I think I told you about this where he had a customer service call with somebody from France. Okay. And nobody could, for whatever reason, this guy didn't speak English well enough. And nobody could, you know, so they okay. came and got me. And so I'm on the phone and this guy's telling me this thing. And then I'm translating it to the customer service person. And we're going back and forth. And like, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, okay. And it was, I don't remember the exact problem. It was pretty nuanced. And the guy was making sense. He just mm-hmm. couldn't, you know. And then 
as I'm relaying this information, I'm learning because within it is a design constraint that I need to be aware of that nobody would ever told me. Nice. And because the parts get replaced when they're damaged, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the places where a figure can be cut for assembly, that seam is a design opportunity. And you probably need a design for it so you don't break something, right? Like a pattern or whatever. At the same time, it's like understanding, like if you're doing a complex design, like where are the most likely points of error and design a break near it so that if they have to replace that part or, or whatever at the factory, like it's less cost. I see. I see evidence of this, and I, I'm I'm with you. I've I've actually experienced the same slow understanding of that process while I was there, and even mm -hmm. after I've even after I left the uh, working physically inside at sideshow. But mm -hmm. um, the closest example for people who actually may be watching this that I can think of it, that's resting near me is um, the six scale figure of K two S O or okay. the KX Enforcer droid. You're familiar with the character from Rogue One, the the mm -hmm. tall, lanky, long legged, and armed droid. Uh, there is a piece, um, he has an antenna mounted to his back. And um, m in most cases, I think Hot Toys would have just, that would have just been part, a permanent fixture there on the back. But for reasons that I'm thinking that you're describing here, they recognize going into it that this was going to present a customer service issue, an issue with breaks and returns. So they designed it to be developed separately and you would have to add it once you add it to the figure once you got it out of the box yeah that's kind of what you're describing there i i take i bring it out of the case right now but the pose that it's in it's interacting with another figure <laughs> and it would be such an absolute nightmare to have to put it back together again but um yeah i mean not not for that point i mean it's it's it makes sense i think i mean at, at mcfarland i remember we were trying to do i'm gonna keep it vague but we were trying to do certain things with with molds and okay. designs, um, and it, again, it it's not a typical role for somebody who who just is supposed to be there drawing stuff. But yeah. what I ended up doing is an analysis of an entire line, all the molds ever made, to see what we actually had and what could be done at what cost, hmm. and end up doing this basically kind of R&D thing for like a day or two to get all these numbers and pieces and parts together and bring it back and say, okay, well, for this, I could do the drawing for this, 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 and this. And I, you know, and it was just like, you, you can't even put that on a job description because it would make no sense. And nobody's qualified to do that unless they've worked for your company for two or three years. Right. Yeah. It just, <laughs> right. Um, but in order for, I think a business to become, that thing you those people have to become like that and that's you know some places don't even do that because it's so nine to five everybody's segmented you don't get that uh interaction yeah so you know mm -hmm. um let's talk a little bit about this guy hang on i, I it's one of my favorite yeah. conversations to bring up with you but um but i don't think a lot of people have heard your um if I can bring the bring the screen up here again. There we go. Yeah. Oh yeah. That one. Man. Hey, cool video. Thanks, man. Did, did you make this? Yeah. Yeah, this was um the, there's a series of videos that I did basically that I started doing called um, my collecting in game. And I, I told myself that once I'd acquired um, five pieces, five grail pieces that, uh, that I, that I des that I really wanted to have in my collection that I would stop collecting completely. And um, so I, I'm down to one. I think I only have one more piece to get if I'm not mistaken, but the one that yeah. I have to get is just so far. Yeah. That project was um, it's pretty special. Look, I'm maybe this is a bad confession, but I've never read a comic book with Thanos in it. <laughs> no, man, that's actually I, that's fascinating. Um, okay, go on. I 
everything I knew about Thanos, somebody told me. And I, okay. you know, I saw him in the movies, but at that point he hadn't done anything yet. You know, he was just the guy that was like at the end of the movies or threatening people or whatever he was doing. Oh, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> um you know there's there's a couple approaches I think to when you work somewhere and career and so on and so forth. And, and I say those things because it is relevant to the project. Um, I, some people, what is, what is the expression? Some people have um, a kind of investment in, in, in that world mm -hmm. where, you know, they feel the need to like, I want to do this or own this or, or be somebody or whatever. Right. I'm very familiar. Yeah. For me, because I don't know the, the the characters and I and I and I care as an artist, I don't like <clears throat> care, right? Sure. Um, I would just kind of do whatever was helpful in the office. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, the reason I did so many bases is because I could draw that stuff, and other people, you know, we could all draw figures. I can draw muscles. I can draw all of it. Yeah. But like, not everybody could draw like you know tech like that or yes. even if it wasn't that tech you just like put an object in space that was so geometric for somebody to sculpt mm -hmm. like you do kind of have to have a particular way of of you know seeing and drawing so i would do a lot of that now being the senior designer or whatever at the time it's like in most organizations that was a junior guy's work junior guys do backgrounds and 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 props and then the senior guy do, does the main figures thing and i was just like whatever makes the team work is what i would do so I did a lot of bases, I did a lot of weapons, and, you know, I saw the concept for that on the wall, and I was like, well, what's going on with this? Because it was like one of those kind of blocky, old school, whatever, and mm -hmm. the issue was, look, this guy's a big guy, and if you do a quarter scale, the, the throne is going to be like 40, 50 pounds, you just can't ship that, it's too big, the box is too big, <coughs> and so on and so forth. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, but you want to do this character, right? It's like, yeah, but you know, we just can't figure it out because the throne. And I'm like, so the problem is you need a chair. Is that in my understanding? I'm like, yeah, I'm, uh, I can design you a chair. <laughs> <laughs> Hold my beer. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so I went and did some drawings and I did some that were like, so there was a spectrum of like, one was very organic and like Giger. Mm -hmm. I feel like and there's then, some Giger esque elements that remained in the final project, but. Yeah, I should. Well, some other day. I should have taken the drawings out, but like, you know. And then another one was very like almost like a like a Stark Tony Stark kind of tech. Okay. And it was just like, well, you know, somewhere in between. But essentially, there was the shape. So if you if you look at the you know where his elbow rests, yes, there's a line that goes out to the front connects down to the base and goes up the back almost like a you know i'm bringing it back up now hang on just for everybody to be on board but um so like okay. in terms of shape i think of it like the nike swoosh right so you're talking about his left elbow there either either way okay either if you look at the chair and profile right mm -hmm. from the back of the armrest to the skull to the seat to the back it's like one continuous line. Okay. So essentially by doing that, you carve out a lot of excess material. You don't have a high back. You don't have a bunch of stuff under his arm. It's just one shape, right? Yeah. And you don't need that depth. So you get that, you know? Yeah. And essentially you trim off a lot of material. It's not that different from an office chair. If you if you just look at it fundamentally, <laughs> right? That is um, the quote about the Thanos on throne maquette that I never thought I'd hear today. <clears throat> but yeah, I see I see your point. It's um, that there's an efficiency to it. Yeah, and because it's like instead of having that big freaking block that one would consider to be um, to be part and parcel with your typical throne. I mean, it's exactly what you're just. Well, there's that dude yeah. again. God, get that guy off my screen. But, so, if you think about it, right? Right. If you are a massive man, like you're six, eight, 400 pounds of muscle and you show up, you're going to have a lot of presence. Yes. Because you're big. <clears throat> oh, but I go. I know where this is going. Yeah. Go yeah. on. If you're a five, five dude, mm -hmm. you don't have a lot. You got to do something to have presence. 
yeah. right? Yeah. You can dress slick, you can have a ton of jewelry, you can be loud, but like there's many ways to have presence, right? right? And so what you needed to do with that throne was a mass reduction. That that really was it. And so <clears throat> at that point, once that shape, once I you know was able to like kind of sell that form, it was like, oh, okay. And then I drew a version of it that was like, you know, not too giger, not too this, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, at that point, I was told things about him, you know, his relationship with death and that lore. But at that point, the MCU had this tech angle to it. So I felt like language wise, it was open to that. And my background, I mean, figure drawing is the last thing I learned. I learned tech, perspective, everything, whatever. So I was looking at Sid Mead and Ralph McQuarrie way before I was trying to look at anything comic book related. Right. Okay. And so, okay, that, you know, that I could do. And then once I showed the throne, it was like, okay, you know, this is a, a new kind of thing. Like, can you do the rest of it? And then at that point, the process being what it was, I was actually given somebody else's design to bring up to the style of detail. Okay. All right. So I, I kind of <clears throat> worked off somebody else's work, but still, you know, kind of changed the, the, the figure and the look. And, and one of the things that I think is, it's hard to explain to people because I've, I've also done a little bit of comics work. Um, is comic books, particularly the classical comic books, are yeah. drawn for efficiency. So even though those designs become iconic to us emotionally, they're not great visual designs. And they're certainly not, um, they, they, they're not gonna hold your attention for years because they're so simple. Most of them, for most of them, that's true. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, with, so with very few exceptions. And, yeah, uh, but so I'm gonna look at Thanos. You have this thing that he wears that, on his shoulder, right? Yeah. And so, if you just make that one clean shape on something like that, if you do that in a film, it's gonna look like he's wearing like a bent piece of rubber, or I don't know, yeah. right? But we know it's armor because it reads like armor, armor in the comics. Because you're, you're you're working with the abstraction, and this artist is is trying to draw a page a day or whatever, right? Yeah. But the one thing that this object had is is a, a rhythm. A and rhythm. so, yeah. And so you take that rhythm and you multiply it across all the features and the details. Okay. And you're 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 telling the same story that might happen in one line or some cross hatching but you're turning it into information and you're making that information related, right? Okay. And in, in many cases, you had like <clears throat> one belt going down the front or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, the 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 throne already had these rhythms and it's Very, like, we reproduce yeah. that on the front, right? Right. And so it's just like an, an echo kind of thing. Just trying and, to find the... Uh back into the throne there. So you, so just just for those watching, just he's talking about the um like I am assuming that you can see the pointer right here where I'm where I'm uh, indicating yeah. this, but we're talking about these these pieces right here and then when you come back to the back of the throne then yes. Yeah, this this bit right here. In fact, the things on the side, those knobs, hopefully yes. I won't get in trouble for saying it. Those were skulls <laughs> originally. Wow. Yeah, little, like, big skull, small... Yeah, there were a bunch of skulls of, like, different people he had defeated. Mm-hmm. But we were, like, told, hey, that's too dark. <laughs> oh, yeah? Okay. You know, um, or too yeah. Giger-esque, I think, was, was what was said. So I was like, all right, I'm going to change it to something else. This is, this, but, is, this is illuminating for me because, I mean, it wasn't until you... When you get this piece in hand and take it out of the box, the the one thing that you're struck by, not just the enormity of Thanos, but the enormity of the throne, especially in comparison, at least in my place, to other pieces in my collection. I mean, this is a quarter scale piece, but Thanos is massive, and obviously his throne is going to be as well. But when you put it that way, the um, I'm, I'm looking at I'm looking at this throne in a completely different light now that I've heard you explain it, and it. It is making more sense. Um, like you, like you were saying, if Thanos were much smaller, then it might ma- might make more sense for him to have a massive throne. But uh, at the same time, the throne might actually 
if the throne winds up winds up dwarfing the person sitting on it, then doesn't that kind of diminish his presence? I, I mean, I think it's like, in some ways, it's 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 the guy that gets a Ferrari, and it's like, okay, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> I've seen um, some people driving Ferraris that I, you know, <laughs> when I was in Malibu, there was a there was a monthly Ferrari meetup in the parking lot of the place where I worked. And uh, right. yeah, so I, yeah, I, I know where you're going. Or I know, I, get, I, I take your point. And I love fries, don't get me wrong. I would love to drive one, but I think you said it's about Bugattis. Like, I still want the stress of owning that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you caught that? Yeah. Yeah, I was listening. Um, but, but, but the reason the throne is smaller was logistics also. It wasn't just like. Yeah, I get but it. It's, you... it's almost like you have to, um, because that that needs to happen. I mean, as speaking as somebody who does collect these things, uh, not so much statues anymore, but um, the shipping costs, especially today, are really a factor. And it's yeah. not just a factor for collectors; it's also a factor for the uh, for the producers of of collectibles. They have to fact that factor that in as well. Um, so yeah, I, I welcome that. Anything that can be done to minimize my costs, while while at the same time giving us something is, and I. I don't want to be hyperbolic here, but I do consider this to be one of the most glorious pieces that that anybody has ever produced. Um, I'm I'm all for it. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm dangerously close to going off the rails about a completely different subject. But I'll, <laughs> I'll avoid. I'll I'll refrain. I'll, I'll, and, I'll hold back. And you know, there was a lot of things that happened in the. You know, we've talked about it around this statue, but I, I just feel the need to say that, like. A lot of people worked on it, mm. you know, mm -hmm. and yeah. I feel and I can and I can and I can explain this and not because like my role got the ball rolling because it was stuck. There we go. And my role guided it to what it was. But it doesn't come out like once the, it left my hands, it still doesn't get to be like that without a lot of really brilliant people. Like really brilliant people, I'm and it's like I'm legitimately hmm? trying to bring up the the credits for, uh, and I don't know that I think something has changed. There we go. There we go. Let me go ahead and um, share this tab instead. But you can see here, like the the lot the list. I don't know. Yeah, I know a lot of these guys. Wow. Yeah, and you know, there's a lot of statues that a lot of us are credited on where what we did doesn't show up at all. Mm -hmm. Like um, on this one, a lot of work was done that just didn't get used. Just huh. is not represented. It's not in the statue, or whatever. Okay. But what you see there still has many, many, many contributions um, from design to sculpt to you know. And there were two sculptors on this one. So yes, that's what I was saying. Yeah. Justice Joseph did the the throne. Mm -hmm. So I worked with him. You know, part of the challenge was, you know, a, a lot of sculptors, I mean, they don't they don't draw. And so there's certain things where they're technically they do it. But things like rhythm and line flow, it, it's not first in their mind. OK, because the tools don't don't work that way. Right. Yeah. And so I had to do <laughs> Yeah, I had to do a lot of work with him to to get it to flow and, and, and start to have the rhythm of the drawings. Mm hmm. And then Will Harbottle did the figure and he took the throne and like did some things to it to kind of like um, complete it. And I think texture and stuff like that. But yeah, anyway, it, but the throne by itself was a lot of work, you know, to, to get it to, to look like the drawings and it, it is a character. And in most cases, most pieces, the character is the gem and the detail mm -hmm. and the base is kind of like the context. Okay, but in this piece, the throne is the character and the presence, and Thanos, because of his mass and his relative smoothness, is the context. I just uh, just for um, anybody who might be curious, I and um, I, obviously this piece is sitting right next to me. It's, it's just I'm looking at it right now. It's 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 massive. It's imposing, <laughs> but I just I really I've taken great care in the way that I present my uh, my display. And uh, one of the things that I've done 
I'm going to have to uh, I directly across. You can kind of see them over here, silhouetted, but there is legitimately a um, he's doing his gesture, his finger, his come hither gesture. But uh, if I can just find the freaking window. Oh, wait, it's a different thing. This is what's in his line of sight. Oh, nice. So directly across, uh, directly across the room is the combined forces of the Guardians of the Galaxy um, coming at him. Uh, it's, this is an old photo. Carol Danvers is no longer there. She's been replaced by, by Venom just because in my head canon, Venom should be with the Guardians of the Galaxy. But that actually makes sense. Uh, he was with them for a little while, but in not just not in the form that I have him. Sideshow hasn't yet done a. Um, a there was a, for a while there. Eddie Brock stopped be, stopped being Venom, and uh, and the symbiote was instead being worn by Flash Thompson, who is um, Spider Man's former antagonist in high school, and who later later became his number one fan. Like, but then wound up. Um, he went off to war in um, in Iraq. And wound up being paralyzed from the waist. Wait, no, no, no. He lost his legs below the knee. Um, and through the Venom symbiote, he was able to, um, well, do things, obviously. But uh, yeah, that's a little bit of a segue there. But uh, but yeah, that's um, that's a subject for another time. The uh, the fundamentals of how to uh, how to display a collection. In order to make, in order to create a theme in a room and have them interact, but we have to talk about your uh, photography show. By the way, um, you mean you and I do, or do you think we should talk about it here? I would, depending on how long your stream goes. But um, I, I don't have, I do have to go grocery <laughs> shopping, but that place is open for another nine hours, so I have tons of time. And as long as we, as long as you're not, I, I was gonna, I was gonna, at some point, I remember thinking, well, I should probably go ahead and end the stream at noon, which is the two hour mark. But as long as we're having fun, people don't have to watch it. <laughs> but yeah, um, for those who don't know, JP brought it up. Um, I was approached by my alma mater, Webster University, a few weeks ago, and uh, they've asked me to um, to start off their 2025-2026 season at the um, at their new all new revamped um, art gallery that they have on campus there, and um, using my six scale figure photography as um, as the subject. Now, this is the theme for that year is going to be collaborations. So in addition to having some of my work uh, presented, they're also going to be featuring the work of, and I don't even know what this person's name is. All I know is that they're, and I quote, hot, some, some hotshot animator. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious to find out who it is so that I can explore this person's body of work because I'm very curious to see who's, who, some of the work that my, my stuff is going to be, you know, shown side by side with. It's. Obviously, I'm interested in that, but I'm also interested to figure out how they're going to display animation in what is a gallery that's traditionally set up for uh, still photography. Uh, so that will be that'll be interesting. Like, I'm really looking forward not only to having my stuff on display, but seeing how they meet that challenge. But uh, yeah, did you have anything that you wanted to say about that? I mean. I wish I could go see it. Um, I think it's cool. You know, I remember our conversations when I when I first started kind of talking to you about you know what you were doing, and I guess there's there's levels of ways of looking at it. You know, you're you're photographing a product so that mm. it could be shown and sold. Okay, um, but then. At another level, you were you were telling stories. Yes. And, you know, when you start to photograph and light them with colored light, now you're you're effectively painting in a way, right? We, yeah, that, we, I remember we had that conversation yeah. when we were in um, when I was still there. And uh, it's like. I remember watching you, you do a couple of different iterations and you try and you look on the computer and, and, you know, I remember we talked a little bit about color theory. You, know? you were the and, one that introduced and, me to Quiller. Yes, that's right. 
Because I don't have and, a formal education at all in art. I mean, I uh, my my photograph my photographic education even at, even at Webster was somewhat limited, and I didn't fully grasp color theory even when I was in my my basic color color class. But mm -hmm. um, it took conversations with you to get me to branch out and explore that and develop the what understanding I have of have of that today is because of our conversations at Sideshow. I appreciate that. And, you know, I just, I could see it, you know, and I can't, I wish I could remember there was one piece that was like, you shot it and it was going into some kind of meeting and I don't remember the character or anything, but uh, I remember I had something to say about it and nobody understood. You weren't in this meeting. Okay. And I was like, first of all, why are we talking about this without the person <laughs> in yeah. the meeting? And and the meeting was in that room across from your from your office. Yes, that's you know, where the, we the, always the lounge. had our, our weekly photo meetings. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm explaining, it and you weren't there, and nobody understood, and I was like, so they told me to go talk to you, and I was like, fine, you know. And then I went, and I and I kind of explained it to you or whatever. And um, wait, I was in the building, but I wasn't in the meeting. Yes, you were not. Oh. I don't think you were in the meeting, and it was very annoying to me because I was like, he's right there. Like, I again, I don't remember the, the, the details of it, but hmm. anyway, that was one of the, the, the first times that I maybe I was on a deadline, I don't know. But uh... it's it's <clears throat> it's possible, but I think it was like, yeah, I just go talk to him, you know. And it wasn't really my my business actually because I wasn't working in anything six scale, okay. It's just like I was in the meeting for other reasons, and you know, I was like, well, everybody's here, you know, it's like relatively senior people, like say your piece, and everybody's like, okay, fine. and I'm looking at this, I'm like, no, and um. And it, and it wasn't like anything that was like bad or wrong or whatever, but I, it was more like, if we're doing this, then there's the opportunity to do this. Okay. And nobody understood. It was, it was something to do with color. And so, you know, I'm talking to you. And I'm dying to know what this was. I know. I don't, I just don't remember. I, I'm sure if I sat there and thought about it for a long time, I mean, we're talking 2015, 16 era, right? So it's like, I would have to just cycle for a long time, like what was going on, what was on, but I, but I just remember like, mm -hmm. so you know, that's when I went and I talked to you. And anyway, like, I think sometimes maybe it just takes another person or a voice or whatever to like say, you know, yes, you're doing your job and here's the purpose, but like you, you're making art and somebody's gonna see that Okay. And it's going to touch them right here. Okay. So the result might be like, they'll go buy it, blah, blah, blah. But whatever, the image sits on the internet for a long time past when the product is available. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, the way that you like this stuff, somebody else is going to like this stuff too. That's, yeah. And I think that sometimes that's missed. Um, the opposite can also be a hindrance. Um, when especially in management, if somebody doesn't understand um, the fascination, then that can, that can also be a hindrance, but that's a, that's yeah, a completely different conversation. It's like, I just feel again, like I'm not, you know, an executive and have no interest in that stuff, but like, same. What you, what you're doing and what a lot of us do, but what you're doing specifically, because you, you're a final image that people would see. Okay. Nobody ever saw my art as far as uh, design, like the actual paper that I worked on, right? They saw the, the outcome. All, all the books that Sideshow put out, I think that there would be room for, uh, <laughs> for something like that to be included, just to, to sh just, just to show off the process. They but, put uh, some sketches in the Star Wars book as like graphic design backgrounds. So if you look at it, you can kind of see the line art, but. <laughs> okay. Yeah, all right. <laughs> but no, like, it's like, A brand, I guess, branding is what I'm saying, something like that. Like the one image that they might see of you might stay with them as like, okay, that sideshow. It would okay. give them a specific feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Just like you might like Norman Rockwell's art, but there's like one Norman Rockwell piece that stands out to you personally. Like when you think Rockwell, you think that piece and, and, and it brings up those feelings. It might not be his most famous or his best work. It's just like it just happens to hit you. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I just I looked at that and I'm like, 
I went and I talked to you and I just felt like somewhere in the situation and I'm not trying to like knock anybody, you weren't being treated as an artist. And I don't know if you thought of yourself as an artist, but it, it you certainly weren't having a dialogue as an artist. And I'm like, the only people that can tell you or talk to you about what I'm talking to you about mm -hmm. is other artists. And the only other artists that were working with color in the building were the painters and the designers. Sure. And I don't know that you were talking to any of us. <laughs> and uh, no. Like, and in fact, um, I think it wasn't until fairly late in the time in, in my tenure there that I um, that I did start um, working, that I did start talking to the painters. Uh, just as an understanding of what, um, just trying to have, and not so much with six scale stuff, but with statues, just trying yeah. to get an understanding, okay, where, what do you think, um, I'm talking about direction of lighting, we, you know, work with me over here, what do, what do you see as being the best uh, best angle for my light to be hitting this, this statue in order to, you know, not just accentuate the sculpt, but also to highlight the, the paint, at the paint details as you saw it. And over time, after just a very few um, conversations, I, that helped me to recognize just by looking at them uh, exactly where they were. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, for instance, at, and Bernie Esquivel is the one who did the paint work on these, um, on these pieces, these, uh, these Macquarie pieces. But now I can look at, these, at his work and recognize where he was seeing the light um, coming from. Um, but whereas at the time, I... I didn't have it. It's obvious to me now, but at the time it was less obvious, and I just needed some help to uh, to reach that understanding. Yeah, and it's it's all like, gosh, it's all how you see yourself, and sometimes that's the social circumstance. Like how you see yourself is often affected by how other people see you and treat you. That's that right? can be true. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, I'm not going to bring up too much stuff, but it, but pay is also a factor, right? If somebody brings you at a certain figure to do a certain thing as a professional, you see yourself differently versus if you're just showing up and, you know, you're kind of, you know, the help, that kind of thing. And, you know, I guess for me, it was just like, I, I always see the max possibility. That's just how I am. And be that's too idealistic or wrong. But I'm like, if I come to talk to you about this problem, my my thinking is that you're one of us and we are all artists. And it's like, well, I want to see the maximum of this because it's going to live in the whatever forever. And it, know, and, and, it, and it can be like that, period. Yeah, It can be like that. That's the most important part. That beauty can exist. It might as well. Yeah, I think you're you're kind of describing. I hadn't really thought of it using this word before, but I definitely recognize the relationship as it's defined by the word. But um, I think, in some regard, I've kind of I kind of came to see you as a mentor. Um, I've in my time at Sideshow, I had a handful. Um, Tom mentored me um, early on in my days work doing photography. Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the fundamentals of figure posing um, that I developed on my own. Um, the initial initially came from him. He he got the ball rolling on that when I was brought on brought on board. And um, then later on, um, you came along and introduced me to color theory. And I think you might be the first person, if not the only person at Sideshow. Um, that's not true. There have been one or two others that actually ever referred to me as as an artist. And this is a very personal thing for me but um i've never really been as much as i've i've liked the idea of being an artist in some regard i never really saw myself as an artist it always occurred to me that i i always felt like i couldn't give myself that title or that description it always and, mm -hmm. and in my mind it had to come from other people um who can call who can refer to me as an artist i don't know it just always, always seemed vainglorious <laughs> um, but, um, if, if I were to like refer to myself as an artist, but, but for other artists, people that I, res whose work I respected, uh, like yourself to come forward and say, and define me with that, with that word, it meant the world. Um, I still struggle with, with referring to myself as an artist and the imposter syndrome is real. Getting back to the, to the, uh, 
to the Webster show that's coming up in a couple of years. Um, there are moments that I'm excited as hell about it. I'm just like, oh, amazing. This is going to happen. But there are other moments like, oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, then again, the, the, imposter, the imposter syndrome flares big time um, when those moments hit. And I'm just like, oh, my God, what's it going to be like? I'm just going to get there and people are going to be like, why are they showing this guy's shit? You know, it's um, so, yeah, it's it's I don't know. It's a journey not to be cliche yeah you know the word the word artist has so many meanings so like right yeah if if by artist we're saying like fancy person like i don't we've like one. myself we've got one <laughs> <laughs> yes yes let's keep it going um but like what <clears throat> when i say artist like i think if you're going to be practical there's no reason for us to be doing what we're doing Therefore, mm. artist. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's that's where I see it. But like, if you talk about um, what we mean to our cultures over time, like we are a specific thing that's that's essential. I think we, all artists, you you sort of express your own personal experience or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you want to be humbled. It's just none of us are that unique to act like we're that special. Yeah. But collectively, we are the voice of our culture in our time. Like we matter collectively. And like, yeah, some stand out and become a big deal and like, okay, fine. You know? Yeah. But like, I think an artist is a type of human being and it's not about like you are that special or I'm that special. Right? right. Like if you take my art and you mix it up with a bunch of stuff right now and you fast forward it 500 years, it's like, oh yeah, he's one of those guys, whatever. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But what matters is like those guys existed, whatever they were. Right. Um, you know, the, the, the Renaissance, like certain things survived, you know, we have the, the, the Michelangelo and the Da Vinci and the Raphael, and those are the things that stand out, you know, and maybe the okay. Botticelli's and all that stuff, but there was a lot of it. Right. And and, the, and and I just don't think you get the peak of the pyramid without the base. And we don't know that much about the base and we don't see all of it. Mm -hmm. Like maybe the, the PhD studies, like the lower level Renaissance artists. Right. Okay. But like they do support that that peak. Okay. Right. And it's... that whole thing is what brought us to this day. You don't just get the peak in a vacuum <laughs> without the, you know. Yeah. And so that's where I would say artist for all of us. And I include myself in that whole thing, mm -hmm. right? Like I'm not, I don't go around saying I'm the fancy person, whatever the case may be. It's just like, we are the voice of our time. And I'm looking at what you were doing and it's like, you know, you're not, the photographs you're making are not a, a spreadsheet entry. You know what I'm saying? I do. It's a Thank lot God. more emotional <laughs> than that. It's just a lot more, you know. So, you know, at that point, it's like you might as well do it right. And like, you know, I just felt like I think it was like a daredevil in an alley. Does that sound familiar? Oh, it does. Okay, it it, it might have been something to do with that. I struggled um, with that one. <laughs> it might, it, I can't. It, I can't remember. I don't remember actually if I did the daredevil though. Um, I don't know. That, I think it was, I, I did do Punisher and I did do. Um, maybe that's it. It yeah. was around that time. Okay. Um, regardless, like to me, I could look at those images and those pictures and be like, I don't know this world very well, mm -hmm. but I understand lighting and, and, and painting and composition. And I also feel like, you know, and you kind of like project stuff onto people and it may not be true, but I, it, I got this feeling that like you, something was limiting you from expressing your heart and your full idea. And okay. my personal suspicion was the people that I was in the room with <laughs> were the problem. <laughs> um, 
Oh, I know. I know exactly what it was, <laughs> and I'm I'm not at, I'm not at liberty. I, I'll talk to you about it afterwards, but I probably okay. shouldn't. That's that's exactly the kind of thing that I probably shouldn't talk about here. But yeah, there there there, there was there. You know, in all things, we're in all things we're we're subject to the wills of other people. Even the people that sure, were in that room, sure. were, even the people in that room um, that, that room were subject to rules put upon put upon them by other people, and that just kind of mm -hmm. goes down. That kind of cascades down to um, to our level. Um, so yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't surprise me at all. I, I 100% know this, what you're talking about had just become a thing. And, uh, yeah, I was struggling with that. Yeah. And, and, then, and there were, and there were other things that I won't talk about too. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. There's, there's some practical thing, but like, you know, like I said, like I, I just, to me, I'm not, I'm not a marketing person, not an accountant. I'm not HR. I'm not whatever. Like I just, I looked at it as art and I was like, well, if you need this photo to do this thing. Mm -hmm. it'll do that check but also the opportunity is right there <laughs> so you might as well like follow through and you yeah. know because like you know the, the thanos thing right like if you're gonna sell this piece for this much because it's going to be this big and this heavy mm -hmm. i mean i get it painting costs but at some point it's like the detail can be there if you sculpt it Right. Like that's not once it's sculpted, it's not going to change. <laughs> you know, you, you know what I'm saying? I do. So it's like, and I'm, I'm sorry if I, if I look distracted, it's because I, I have a copy of this photo somewhere <laughs> and I really want to get it up on the screen, but I don't think I, I don't think I'm going to be able to find it. It's not on my computer. It's clearly on my phone somewhere. But um, it's still a long yeah. time ago. It is. I'm surprised. I, I, every time I see it, I'm kind of surprised that I still have it. I'm just going to email these things to myself so that I can bring them up on screen. And I'm not even 100% sure that that's it. But like when I when I try to like put myself in that room that day or whatever, mm -hmm. that's one of the things that comes up um, okay. in my mind. So but yeah, I mean, like, if the opportunity exists, I'm like, you know, do it. But like, over time, I started to see like, yeah, you know, you would you would at least my, it just seems like you were more free and you started doing things and I'm like, Oh, that's, that's neat. You know, like, <laughs> and, and I remember like the, the one you, with the clones that you just showed, mm -hmm. like that would just be a cool poster. Like I want that. You know what I mean? Like, right. I don't even necessarily, I'm not a fan of the material. I don't care. Like, I just want the image. Like it looks cool. You know, the, the you know, everything's all warm. You got the blues. Like, from a color theory perspective, that image is kind of brilliant. Because oftentimes, what you what people tend to do is super obvious. Is you put the warm colors on the subject, and the cool colors in the background, and you do the the, the easy like push pull thing. Okay. But like, that's inverted. Like, the environment is warm. The villains are warm, and like the one the clones that are fighting have the blues in their cool, and you made them pop trying to pop that up again but i think i i think i yeah i think i closed it out okay yeah. never mind that would have been a oh. that would have been a solid education from jp mavinga right there ladies and gentlemen but uh, i have well let me see here i did find if i can just pull it up here and again apologies for the tedium of uh, of waiting for me, <laughs> but was it something like this it might have in one of those yeah yeah maybe in the, maybe in the same family yeah it, it, it was around that time the, the image i'm thinking of it, it was this i think it was another alley shot okay because it was these elements uh but then there was another image that was like mostly red and i don't know which character that was but anyway it was maybe i'll think of it later it doesn't matter but like yeah you know there was just certain things that i'm like well if you can do that like Mm -hmm. you know i'm uh oh crap i'm really really bad at this <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't really get the chance to prepare but like yeah there we go that's another one from that list but um again that there were several yeah. shots there were several different shoots that happened in that alley set and that alley by that alley by the way that alley set there was made for us by a guy named chris comston well, yeah. Are you familiar with him? Uh oh. His it's awesome though. His his steadiest gig, as far as I can tell, 
Now, this is the first time he'd done set pieces for uh, for movies and, and such before, but this this was his first time actually building something at this scale. So he uh, he took his he took some time to get it done, but when he uh, wow. but when he presented it to us, I think there was a there was a revolving door of all the artists at Sideshow that once they got wind that this was in there um, for like a day or two. It was nonstop a procession of Sideshow artists just coming into my studio to check this thing out and just just check out the details on that um, oh on that uh, on that brick wall for instance. I mean, there's just it's just remarkable. Yeah. But his real his steadiest gig is he is um, if you you're probably not a Metallica fan, but Metallica's guitarist <laughs> um, yeah Kirk Hammett. Um, you'll see him constantly on stage. His guitars will be decorated with all these beautiful paintings of Universal monsters, the Mummy, the Wolfman, Frankenstein, all of them. And uh, and Chris Compton has painted every single one of those guitars for Kirk. Yeah. <laughs> so this this set, if you see it at any of the old school sideshow photos, or even in, even in the most recent ones, when you see it, just remember that this the Kirk Hammett's um, guitar painter is the man who created that that film oh. a little bit of work a little bit of trivia there i actually like metallica a lot do you, you know? okay yeah i i just saw them recently um, yeah of, they, uh, i got sick <laughs> of the many bands of that sound i think like they were the most uh interesting like there was a point where around the time when i really decided like i'm gonna do art I mm -hmm. kind of checked out of popular music. It just kind of happened at the same time. So this was summer of 95. That's probably for the best. Um, it, so it's funny, like I was really, so there was a time when I was listening to whatever's on the radio. And then from about 91 to like 93, 94, I got really into hip hop and rap. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, as one did in those days, that was uh, yeah, it's like, really when, emerging like, into the mainstream then. Right before it blew up, so it was like, because um, the chronic, Dr. Dre's the chronic just like opened everything up, right? Yeah. yeah. But like, so about the year before that, it was like, it was a couple things I was kind of into, I was getting into it. But for me, it was like, uh, I don't know, a little bit backstory. Like, I was born in the Congo. Um, mm -hmm. My first kind of 10 years of life, more or less, were in Africa, some in the US. But, you know, so I, am aware of what was going on in different parts of Africa. And there's obviously black people here, but I didn't fully understand what it was, the story lies, you know? And so the first thing that resonated with me was like, I think Tupac's early work before okay. the crazy stuff. But, you know, his first album was like these stories. Every song was a story and some of them were really funny, mm -hmm. but like, the, you know, dark in a way but some of them were really, really painful and i was like oh wow like you know there, there's a different kind of suffering here and you know the chronic told those stories but it was so entertaining and and it and it 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 balanced the darkness with the humor right okay yeah and for me because again, I enjoyed all kinds of music, but it had a, a full sound, mm. right? Whatever they were doing to modulate that bass was like a full sound. Yeah, the production and, value on that record is, um, and I, I say that because I legitimately have it on vinyl. Um, <laughs> yeah. But um, but yeah, the, I I don't think I appreciated it at the time. It wasn't until later years that I when I went back and just really listened to the album in its entirety that I really began to appreciate the production value, which I think I think Dre became really as I recall, Dre became really known for that, more for being a producer than um, than actual. I mean, his obviously his own work was great, but uh, but he was producing a lot of other people's stuff as well. And it's yeah. But go on. Yeah, it was, but to me, there was there was something I could connect with, mm -hmm. and the kind of braggadocious stuff was funny yes. and fun in that album. Yeah. But as time went on, it wasn't funny anymore. It was almost like they really meant it, and I was like, "Well, okay, you know, you're 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 no longer bringing me into this story. I have less and less sympathy for what's going on." Um, and I kind of checked out. 
And so everything also on the radio lost appeal around 95. I just completely checked out. That makes sense. And for a while, I didn't listen to anything. And the few things that remained with me among them was Metallica. I didn't mind. You know, like Load. I remember when that came out, I was like, oh, this is okay. Yeah. And I liked it, you know. And there's some things I missed that like I ended up liking later. Um, the the last, from a chronological perspective, hip hop album that I really liked was the the score, you know, the Fuji's the score. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't, I didn't come, I didn't, I didn't really explore them until much later. Me too. Like yeah. it, it, I think it's a '96 album, but I listened to it in 2004. And yeah, I, was, uh, I was even later than that. It was like 14 or 15. Like so, yeah. Okay. 20 years on, I'm I'm finally finding out. I knew about the Fugees, obviously, and uh, Lauren Hill, obviously. But um, yeah. and uh, oh, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of the of the of the dude who ha- who went on to have his own great solo career. Um, Wyclef. Yeah, Wyclef. Yeah, I, th- I think it was it went Wyclef. For me, it was Wyclef, Fugees, Lauren. That was the that was the chronology <laughs> oh, of crazy. my exposure. Yeah. 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 So backwards, but I mean, so the the thing about that I liked about hip hop versus a lot of other music um, was the humor and the storytelling is always mm. there, right? Yeah. And if you look at like some of the rock star, like the rock ballads, you know, mm-hmm. it's like what makes those songs often stand out from the whatever is like the degree of storytelling and the emotion and the arc in the okay. story you know it's it's in the music too but like you know some of those again like okay so take guns and roses right yeah most of their music for whatever reason i don't really like it but like november rain sweet child of mine like those two songs are just some of my favorites it's almost like you know most of that stuff sits below what i like and then those two songs it's up like way up there <laughs> right really <laughs> yeah everything else is like like welcome to jungle i get it it's fun I, I i i don't dislike it i like it in a certain it gets you a certain kind of mood but like yeah okay you know um i've i've been struggling a lot with that era of music lately because because what the you know guns and roses was obviously a paragon at, at, at the time i mean i remember i saw them open up for um for aerosmith live in 1988 when they were at their they were just getting going. They were just, they were hugely popular already. But, um, but that entire era of, of music, a, a lot of it would be classified as, um, oh, what do they call it? Sleaze metal, I guess. <laughs> yeah. You get like your, your, you get your uh, Motley Cruz, you know, and it's, it's like, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of misogyny going on in it. And by today's right. standards, you know, I, I listen, I listen to that music a lot today, especially when I'm driving. And what I've had to come to realize is I've, I've got to tune out the lyrics. I mean, if you go listen to the second album by Extreme or even the first album by Extreme, I mean, there's some, some of those songs are absolutely pedophilic in, in their content. And I, and I think that that's actually, there's a rich history of that in, um, in rock and roll, getting, going, going all the way back to Buddy Holly. But, um, but just the sleazy quality of the lyrics it hasn't aged well and i'm really I, I i sometimes struggle with it but by the same at the same time i can't ignore the massive talent of the musicians of that era the guitar mm-hmm. players the drummers what have you and and i think that's legitimately what brings me back um i'm i'm, I'm just here for the guitar solo man <laughs> if that makes any sense or, or, you know, for the drums or the interaction, the interplay between the drums and the bass. I mean, there's just nothing like it. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, I think about what you get really talented young men who are not fully formed and fully mature as human beings, but are yes. that way as artists. Like, what are they going to say? That's it. That's right? all that, that's all that they know how to talk about. And at the time, that's one, like, I, I was I was forming myself, so I re- it resonated with me. That's how I feel about like, but I guess for me, like again, I'm not a hip hop authority at all. You know, it's just the things that happen to come across like my way mm. that I saw. I I had a backwards experience because I, you know, again, 
my first album that connected with me was Tupac's first album. Mm. And it was very much a young man's album. It's very youthful, but it was it was soulful in the sense that like it told stories that really resonated. And some of them were extremely funny and extremely personal. Like he has this song, like if my homies call, like it's it's a it's about friendship. And every I think young man that's had a best friend can relate to that. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Like the, the loyalty, the rebellion and getting in trouble, but also like he's talking about those things we all know in a much more dangerous world than what we live in. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Many of us who, who grew up in a, let's say, more comfortable suburban dynamic. Or rural. Rural, yeah. yeah. You know, so it's like I recognize the friendship, I recognize the, the humor and the adventure, but that's not my danger. Right. And so that's but you've where got, you're empathetic enough that you, you can you yeah. hear it and you understand. Yeah. I mean, when I, you know, when we came to the U S for the second time, like we <clears> just <throat> left Liberia and like, it was, it was falling apart. Mm. So, you know, I remember being 10 years old and we were in this like stuffed in this like taxi, me and my dad. And like, we got stopped. Like basically they put like a tree on the road. And they, and they like call it a checkpoint <laughs> and they would check IDs and they're like flipping them around. And you can tell some of them can't really read and they're very young. So at 10 years old, I was kind of a big kid. So I was probably like five, three, five, four, which is kind of tall for a 10 year old. Yeah. But like there's other kids, they were probably teenagers, but like they were holding like legit guns aimed at the car. Yeah. And so this was like right before. And so we got out and, you know, we moved to Wisconsin. I remember when we got a TV turning on the news and like Liberia is on CNN and bodies in the streets and the yes. whole thing. So it's like, I remember that. I remember seeing such coverage. Yeah. You know, I didn't know what happened to my school until gosh, like 20 some years later when, when like, I connected with some people on Facebook and they had pictures of it. So it's like, I, I still had this sense of like danger, not being far away in that respect. Yeah. Uh, warfare and life or death. But the inner city version of that was something that I, I could, I could empathize with them, but it was like a different kind of scary because they were in it. Mm. I, I could sort of like, went by the edge of it and it was scary enough you know and, and they lived it daily and so it it just i guess it hit me a lot um and so i enjoyed that aspect as opposed to what was going on in pop and rock which was always like love songs and stuff like that or yeah know, the, the you know the braggadocious kind of thing well then i felt like hip-hop also switched to that and that's when i really lost interest but the, the think, music uh, i kind of feel like if, if an artist is allowed to stick around long enough, then, um, then that's going to, that hopefully is the direction that it's going to go. Um, I keep thinking about this. This is reminding me of that, uh, that comedian um, that's pretty popular these days on TikTok and, uh, and on YouTube, a guy named Matt Reif. Are you familiar no. with him? No, he's, he's a, he's just, he's a young guy. Um, absurdly handsome, um, buff. Uh, and uh, he's 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 made his name on TikTok, and a lot of his um, a lot of his stuff is he's, he's just really really crass, and um, but I mean funny. But he's able to get away with it because he's young, and handsome, and and as Keith Lee says here, he likes to be shirtless. Um, <laughs> but the thing about but the thing about somebody like Matt Reif is his kind of humor is going to only take him up to a certain age. And then yeah. he's just going to come off as creepy. Uh, and you can say, think, say the same thing about the sleaze rock artists, the older that they get. I mean, it's, it's one thing to, as you talked about, um, to have th- that kind of subject matter being created by guys in their late teens, early twenties. But once the guys are in their forties and fifties, then it's, it's a completely different ball game. Um, that's true. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm legitimately, I've legitimately experienced that at some point in your life, you get to an age where you're, where you recognize that the game you may have had when you were younger is no longer there. And, and, <laughs> and, and you've lost a lot of that appeal. And uh, so you have, if you, I mean, I'm sure that we've all experienced and, and the closest example, the most culturally relevant example that I can think of it off the top, think of off the top of my head would be Matthew McConaughey's character from Dazed and Confused. The guy who never really leaves town and keeps hanging out with the high schoolers. Um, <laughs> it's, it's absolutely, it's absolutely creepy. And, uh, and you have to, uh, you have to mature and you have to age. And I think that, and when it comes to music, your, your music must also mature along with you. You can't keep writing songs about high school and our young yeah. love. I mean, your, yeah. your, your, your notion, <laughs> hopefully over time, your notion of love and romance and relationships evolves and matures mm -hmm. into something a little bit more stable and less me centric, mm -hmm. less, less about the taking and more about the giving that I would hope it's at some point. Yeah, I mean, speaking of hip hop, this came up with uh, Andre 3000's new flute album. Have you heard about this? Uh, I've I've heard whispers in the background he, about Andre 3000, but you know, like he is one of the the rappers that I that, that stayed with it, right? Okay. So I, I I listen to Outkast stuff in the 2000s and whatever, like sure. And um, you know, even when I was out of paying attention, I still heard their stuff and I liked it. Okay. Right. Well, he recently did an album and it's him. It's instrumental. It's like flute and stuff. It's, I've heard that's some what, of it. That's what I understand. Yeah. I, beautiful. I, okay. But he, he did an interview about it and he was like, what am I going to rap about? <laughs> you know, like he just, <laughs> and he, it, right? and he was saying, there's not much. Like, he tried, but it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't authentic or something like it that. It feels forced, maybe even disingenuous. I mean, right? I mean, that's maybe. that would be my yeah. thought. I mean, once you get past a certain point where you're no longer, I don't even know what the word is. What the, I don't even know if I have the word for it. Um, I think it goes back to being the voice of your culture. Mm. And, and, and our culture uh, is doing many things at different times, right? Yeah. But like, if you... If you have a house and you're a parent and you know you got the the car and the and the more I, mean, I don't know how they live particularly per se but like you know you're dealing with with like you know real estate and financial assets and mm. and, and all this kind of stuff and you're you know you're, you're sitting down with lawyers and it's time you like you're not necessarily thinking about your beef in the streets it's that's not it. that that's anymore it. Yeah. right and it, that's that's not the aspect of culture you necessarily can speak to or want to speak to, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, I'm sure, you know, everyone's had their love and, and heartbreaks, but it's no longer about like, should I talk to that girl on the other side of the lunchroom, right? Like you've probably maybe been with your wife for whoever for like, you know, 10, 15 years. Like that's an aspect of culture too. And it's a different yeah. thing, <laughs> it's a different, you know. Yeah, where do you where do you go? What, what kind of a well are you, do you have to draw from at that point? I mean, I know that there have been artists who have successfully taken motherhood, for instance, and translated it into into music, and it's been pretty successful. There's an mm -hmm. artist I follow called uh, Mercure. Um, she it's it's um oh god, I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but it's basically a multi instrumentalist who's kind of develop who who writes her own music or produces her own music. Um, and um and records it all but uh, but then she winds up the, the band itself is called mercure and she winds up having there it's danish i want to say she's from denmark but she started out okay. doing black metal type stuff this really ethereal style black metal that kind of led into her doing more folk like scandinavian folk stuff and then she became a mother which apparently led her to go back to doing black metal uh, <laughs> but the, and she's released an album that's um that's very very good and I've, en I've i've enjoyed listening to it two or three times all the way through but the content is heavily focused on motherhood which i just can't relate to um but apparently for others can reasons. yeah for obvious reasons yeah, i <laughs> i mean even as um even parenthood in general if you want to go gender neutral but um 
any of any yeah. of those any of those any time that an artist kind of kind of tries to or like even with movies tv shows what have you any plot that's focused around the concept of being a parent more often than not i check out i, I don't i can't it doesn't resonate with me um and yeah. you know i know that you've been a parent now for what four years three five shut up it was, yeah. that long, it was that long ago when we were sitting in the bar in Ventura and you informed me that you were expecting. It's, it's about to be five. Well, she's about to be five. Wow. Um, you know, first of all, I mean, motherhood and fatherhood are, are quite different. Um, hmm. I think parenting in general has an, has an intensity to it that isn't matched by anything else. Hmm. I, don't I, know, I, it's I, not, I get it. I, uh, I don't envy it it's not like the worst thing or the best thing. It's just like, it has a particular type of stake that is that once it, it hits you, it's like, okay. And, and the closest analogy I can think of is like, you know, if like all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're doing your thing and like an alien mothership thing beams you up and says, Hey, you know, uh, we need you to introduce alien here to the world. <laughs> and uh, the galaxy's a stake. Don't you know he's a prince or she's a prince, a princess? This is don't the best her, way don't... of describing it to me. You could have chosen. Okay, <laughs> it's like you were. Don't let... It's like you had this waiting in the wings. But please, yeah, continue with this. I thought about it a lot. It's like, yeah. don't let this thing die because the galaxy's a stake. That's Good fascinating. Luck. You know. And you, and you take a map to Earth. It's like, hey, this is a, this is actually kind of a scary place if you don't know Jack. Yeah. Right. And the fate of the galaxy is on my head. Like, oh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and and you know, like you can tell, this this being will become independent and capable, and maybe even better than you at life. But for right now, you could really mess it up. <laughs> probably better. Th probably better than you at life as well. But uh, yeah. Uh, you know. So. I can see a mom turning to black metal, you know, like I know quite a few um, women that are artists that I've known kind of over the years. Um, you know, even my sister is uh, creative. Yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, I've had these conversations, you know, with her about some of the intensity and the struggle and, and you do feel like, yeah, the, the comments true. Like, there's no instruction manual on top of it. <laughs> um, but I, I, I do think like women have a, a obviously a different emotional constitution than men. Um, from my understanding um, <clears throat> of the, I guess, sociology, is that women tend to be a little bit more neurotic or are prone to negative emotion. Okay. Um, I'll let you say that that's my understanding. Um, you know, an instance, for example, men tend to overstate things about themselves and women tend to understate things about themselves. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, men tend to like overlook their flaws more often and women tend to like overstate their flaws more. Often. Oh, I definitely don't over, I definitely yeah. don't overlook my flaws. <laughs> Well, but the tendency tend, the, the, is there. Yeah, that's why I yeah. say tend to, right? Like, yeah. so, so some men are, are are more like women in that women in that way, or but generally speaking, and so you know, I think mothers, from the conversations that I've had with them, you know, sort of in my family and friends, mm -hmm. have this kind of amplified sense of like, I might be doing it wrong, ah. you know. I mean, every parent feels that, but, you know, I think most many men and fathers that I've talked to operate more in this space of like, okay, vision, this is what I got to do. It needs to be like this. I bet if I do this, this will happen, you know, right? And and even in the insecurity, that's kind of like the, the headspace that I, okay. I tend to see fathers being in. Um, and women, mothers tend to be more like, oh my gosh, am I messing this up much more, you know? And um, I'd be interested to to find out what is known about how the different sexes evolved in that regard. Um, 
I mean, ob- I mean, obviously, it's a sliding scale. There are going to there are going to be some fathers who are going to express those tendencies mm-hmm. more than others, and and vice versa with uh, with mothers. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's always tendencies and generalizations, you know, like. Like and, how, did and that, sometimes, how did that serve the? How did that serve humanity ten thousand years ago when we were all, <laughs> you know? Well, I guess there was quite a bit of civilization going on back then. But let's say fifty thousand years ago. Yeah, I mean, like you know, a lot of those things are theories that you can't necessarily prove or Thank disprove. You. That's you know? But like, you know, even when you say something like ten to, yeah, like it can be like fifty five, forty five. You know what I mean? Like. Yes. It, it, yeah. it, it, you know, it, it could be more than that or less than that, but sometimes it's just like a slight difference. But mm-hmm. you know, mothers are going to be generally speaking, not even generally, but by far more nurturing. That's just how you know women are, or whatever. Yeah, and, that's and, been my know, experience. Yeah, um, empathize and sort of you know, you know, whereas you know, men and and and. Uh, they say this is, might be an, an advantage of evolutionary, but like the ability to detach emotionally and then act, right? Oh. So, in the face of danger, like you, your body wants to scream and panic, fight or flight, right? Yeah, yeah. but it's like, all right, well, if if I don't know, some kind of large animal just entered the space, it's like you want to hold those you love and protect yourself or maybe protect them sure. that's your that's your natural emotional response and for children somebody needs to do that at the same time somebody needs to like kill the thing yeah or fight the thing yeah right and so it makes sense that like those two uh impulses would be express themselves in different places and it makes sense that like the one with the bigger skeleton more bone density more muscle density would be the one to like disconnect from their own sense of panic to go fight the thing in general Mm -hmm. some men won't and then the one that has the more you know nurturing disposition but also has the softer body the body that feeds and and Mm -hmm. heck grows the baby would be the one to worry more about the the emotional the nurture and the and the and the connection of like i feel your fear whatever you know i got you that kind of thing right yeah. but still both are human and both should be capable of both and so you know and i'm sure there have been i'm sure there have been examples of that throughout the course of time where you know dad's gone the the, the thing ate dad so the, so when the next thing comes along, then mom has to be the one to fight it off. I mean, that's you know, that's just the what yeah. what did I what was that what was that quote that I uh, that I had on my Facebook page recently? Um, oh God, it's gonna escape me. But uh, catastrophe is the metabolism of the universe. Yeah, I mean, look, I don't like the the thing about evolutionary biology is it's all theories, you know, and who knows, yeah, sure. like. Yeah. If you look at lions, it's like a mess because male lions basically exist to fight other male lions and to mate. They don't really hunt. They're not really productive. And they're only useful for getting rid of each other. Right. Right. The yeah. females raise mm-hmm. the young and the females are actually the better hunters. Yes. And in, in generally speaking, because they're leaner, they're faster, they're quicker. They're just, you know, whatever. So male lions cooperate when they're brothers. Huh. Right. That's when you'll, yeah, you'll see like oftentimes brothers, you know, two or three or whatever will lead a pride and they won't necessarily like beef with each other. They won't conflict with each other at all. Really? Not. Yeah. 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 You'll you'll see prides are led by brothers because they aren't for whatever reason. But like when they encounter other male lines and like, you know, because they'll harass the females, they'll, it's crazy with lions because males will kill the young of other males. Yeah. And then the females will go into heat soon after their young die automatically. And then that's, that's how they pass their genes on. Mm. Right. So in the lion domain, males are just mostly terror and the problem. And they're only useful for getting rid of other males, you know, and it's not. That's so, rough. That's rough. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, in, in humans, you can see where it's like, okay, well, if you're talking about warfare as opposed to like, 
other animal dangers. It's like, yeah, males are good for fighting other males mm. and not really for, you know, <laughs> passing on language and culture, you know? So again, you can theorize about that stuff all day long, but like I, to me, like going back to like art and story, it's like, you're shattering yeah. people's dreams, by the way. I just want you to. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, if you're having to tell stories, it is true. Like once you enter this other phase of life, there's different stories to tell. And parenting is one that just happens to dial up the intensity hmm. because there is that sense of like, it takes you back to, to how you started. Mm -hmm. And really? you just, yeah, like, I I spent a lot of time in my memories from zero to five because of you know, and okay. that's 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 a the bulk of the frame of reference. But you see how you can really mess things up, and so there's an intensity there, you know, that is completely different from I don't know high school problems or college problems. Let me make sure that I understand this. You just something you just said was very interesting to me. You spent a lot of time in your memories zero to five. You yes. have memories of zero from zero to five? Yes. Have you always had those memories or is it something that surfaced after you had a child? I've always had them. I can remember um, things that happened before I could walk. Wow. I, I um, have one or two memories like that, but not not any not anything in abundance. It's not abundant. Like it it becomes so once school started. There seems to be that rhythm. Yes. Introduced more memories that I can file into, like, yes, this time and that time and that place and that summer, that whatever. Mm -hmm. Prior mm -hmm. to that, it's just like this mixture of things that are, that are, you know, when I talk to my parents, I describe odd things and then they tell me, okay, that was roughly this year. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I can tell certain things I couldn't walk because of what I was doing. Like right. I remember holding certain things to stand. Okay. Um, that's wow. I remember a landscaping light. That's like a sphere, like a ball of like acrylics with like a light bulb in it. Yeah. And I remember holding it like this and like, it would be warm. So I would have not been much taller than the thing, which puts me at, you know, somewhere between one or two years old. Jeez. Um, I remember a certain interaction with my parents. I remember certain trips we made. Yeah. But also like cultural differences that really stand out, you know, that, that now when you're, when you're trying to impart that to a child, it's like, what are, you know, there's values that you just don't think about. You just take for granted. Now when it's time to do it, you're like, Oh, I have how my, my pre toddler memories that I have. I, I have, I have two pre education age memories that I that I can recall one is legitimately I had to have been probably I don't know if I was still in diapers or for, for whatever reason might but I was laying on my back and my mother was leaning over me and she was making goofy faces and saying things to me. And, and I remember she was actually talking to me. But yeah. in my memory, it's gibberish, because I didn't have language yet. <laughs> Right? Does that make any yeah. sense? Yeah. Uh, the other one is just really wild. And, but in the, in the first house that we lived in, in the little town, the little coal town that we grew up in, there was a, there was a shower in the basement, just like an open air shower in the basement, which was pretty common. Actually, there's one here in this house, an uh -huh. open air shower down in my basement. But, um, but this whole neighborhood was constructed for factory workers and for, um, oh, there was a, Oh, there was a, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but the, uh, like a steel works, like a steel mill, uh, that a lot of people who were lived around here used to work in and, um, they would come home from work. The men would come home from work and they'd be so filthy that they, they couldn't go into the house. Instead, they'd go straight to the basement, rinse everything off, and then they'd come into the house. But we had one of those in my, in the basement of the town of the house that we first lived in, in that little coal town in central Illinois. And I have a very vivid memory of my mom and dad um, in that shower together with, and at the same time they were encouraging me to like run through the water. 
It, it was like a game <laughs> we were playing. Like I was just this little toddler that had, it still had no language, but I was just yeah. laughing and uh, with my family and just running beneath the, the, the shower, the shower spray. But that's it. That's those are legitimately the only two pre-education memories that I can think of. Now, yeah, I've, I mean, now I've gotten now now I've gotten it out there, and it's it's in the ether. <laughs> Terry's memories of showering with his parents. <laughs> it's different for different people. Um, yeah. You know, I have some siblings that don't seem to remember much. I happen to remember a lot, but. I've always been that way. Like I, I, you know, I'm, 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 yeah. Uh, I always reference memories often. Like I constantly, you know, sure. So like, even like, you know, we talk about sideshow days, like I'm, I'm constantly sometimes referring to those for different reasons and I re I revisit them. And so I'm pretty aware of the time slots of like projects that i did and stuff like that because it's mm -hmm. constantly like you know even mcfarland like it, it's just you know um i uh, think i think that makes sense if you're thinking about it in the way that i think you are just um when you're when you're referencing it you're com you're comparing it almost seems like that would be you're comparing your experience then with a with the similarities to your the experience you're experiencing now and trying to draw upon that experience to help inform your decision in the current scenario yes yeah. like when when i was doing those macquarie pieces like i i would think back to like my first encounter of like sid mead's art and then first encounter of macquarie's art and first encounter of like you know all, so it goes all the way back and so the mm, or even better when i was doing like the the master's universe stuff so i did i did a little I think I did Skeletor's base, mm -hmm. and then I worked on Shira and like uh, Tweeterhead's Hordak. Okay. Um, so like, I would always reference back to what the cartoons made me feel, and like, how do I capture that on the paper? Which puts me right back to like, okay, 1987, 88, you know. Mm -hmm. And so while I'm thinking about the Saturday morning cartoon, I'm remembering what we ate, what we did or whatever. And it, and it fits in that time slot. Okay. If that makes sense. So I'm constantly doing stuff like that when I work or live or whatever. So I think the memory stay active is what I'm, I guess, kind of getting at. I think that makes sense. I'm going to, um, going to bring something else up here since you brought, since you brought him up. Oh, God damn it. They keep changing things on me. Dead air. I hate dead air, but here we are. What are you what are you pulling up? I'm pulling up an image. Allegedly. <laughs> of um and I'm gonna have to go into Finder to do it. I, there was there was recently an update. In the, in the Mac in Mac OS and I think that they must have changed now that now I have to reevaluate the way that I do things um, but I was gonna ask if you were aware of that Ralph McQuarrie actually has a favorite painting that of his did, that he did of his that he did and and I've after all this effort mm -hmm. I've I've gone and brought up an image that is not that painting <laughs> yeah so I have to uh, I have to try it all, all over again. My first encounter with Macquarie's work is something he did. I think it was for Star Trek, the motion picture. Uh -huh. um, I think he worked on the. I've I've only recently seen these. I'm aware uh, of what you're talking about, but go on. Yeah, it's dope as hell. It's like that triangle. Um... So anyways, this the way Discovery looks. Yes. Actually, that's exactly it. I, I've, I've only recently been made aware uh, of this. Is, this is, this is legitimately Ralph McQuarrie's favorite painting that he ever did. Oh, huh. for Star Wars. Oh, okay. For Star Wars, yeah. It's and we it's, never got to see that. It's holiday special. Wow. It's the Star Wars holiday special. Isn't that wild? Yeah. It 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 feels like a. Uh... Hobbiton with some tech. It does smell like <laughs> Hobbiton with some strange Star Wars holograph tech. Yes, I totally agree. But yeah, anyway. I mean, 
there is a warmth to it that mm -hmm. isn't characteristic, at least from my memory of his stuff. Yeah. I mean, even the stuff on Endor um, totally was, uh, was, uh, was different than what we're seeing here. But then I, I guess like that, that's, that's kind of how it's supposed to. I mean, this is hearth and home kind of stuff, which is, uh, and, and Wookiees are a good deal more civilized than the Ewoks were. So that, that kind of tracks. And that's, the, and that's, of course, we're talking about the holiday special. I mean, I guess that that would be the vibe that they're trying to project. Right. Because you want, uh, you want that. Um, that's, the, that's, the, that's the experience that you want our heroes to have when they come into Chewbacca's home for life. I can see why that's a favorite. It's, it's not the most uh, crazy concept, but it is the most, uh, I don't know immersive warm yeah it's immersive and it's warm and it's, it, it's like the all the natural wooden elements um the way that they it doesn't really blend with the tech although i, although I guess it kind of does when you look at the um when you look down here at the um at the hollow emitter which i'm guessing is supposed to be their version of a television yeah. um and the way that the uh, that the roots from the um, from the tree kind of um, kind of reach around and cradle it. That's that's the, and I want to say that I've actually seen coffee tables and the like that look similar to this. Yeah, yeah. people make yeah. them like wood stumps and stuff. Yeah, but then you've got this kind of whatever this machine is back here that's hanging out in the kitchen, just kind of like shoved into the corner there. But uh, it's all this wood broken up by just the occasional bit of tech. And um, but that's realistic. I mean, that's. Right? Yeah. You know, we we bring in all this like industrial design stuff and like stick it in our in our you know like an oven or microwave is like this kind of like slick whatever and you're sticking it in a kitchen with like marble and wood like it's it's that yeah right like yeah I guess that yeah you're we, right we, that's exactly what we do we accept it as like yeah of course but like actually you know like I'm over here know, like, judging my kitchen right now. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine if you like bought like a flat screen TV that had like a, like a wooden, like a wood grain edge to it? Like, no, no. Nope. <laughs> I mean, I can, but I can't. I can't bring myself to believe that I do that. It, it just wouldn't not, work. Yeah, it's yeah. not sold that way. So, no. Hmm. I to me that that feels right. I mean, hmm. you know, one of the one of the interesting things about um, visual design that. Informed. I, so I remember when I was little in in different parts of Africa. Okay. Right. One of the things that happened there is is you're still feeling the effect of say the last 500 years hmm. of um, colonization and obviously a lot of dark things that happened. But what what you have there is something that's very well captured in some aspects of Star Wars. Hmm. Is you have different cultures slam together. Yeah. Right. Different types of technology slam together. And so it's 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 very kind of Western to say, you know, advanced versus primitive. Okay. But actually what's happening is <clears throat> in Africa the the, the 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 technology is social and improvisational, right? How so? Is it is it well a lot of indigenous cultures, if you if you were to live there and hang around, you would realize that you do not understand the social dynamic. It's very complex, right? There's all these nuances and rules how people live. Okay. Well, how you live the technique is a technology, right? Okay. Here, people struggle so much that they need – there's all kinds of, like, tools that are developed to compensate for problems, from social services to therapists – to you know prisons let's be real these are all compensations for absent social technologies okay that in indigenous domains have ways of being worked out where everybody knows and so you don't have certain problems right you don't see that many depressed indigenous people it doesn't happen that way because of other social technologies okay right your your therapist is not a stranger in that context it just never is right so it's like those are technologies that don't have a material manifestation, right? Instead, what you end up having is also 
this very kind of like flexible adaptive culture. And so you'll see somebody wearing, you know, a traditionally woven piece of cloth with a Nike t-shirt. Yes. And it's an improvisation. Mm. It's it's jazzy. It right? is jazzy. Whereas today, you know, in the West, you have to wear, you know, this jacket with these pants and these shoes and you know, it's very structured. So when I look at an image like this, it's like it's realistic to me in the sense that if you put a culture whose technology is is social and improvisational and adaptive, mm-hmm. and another culture's technology is material and structured, and you slam them together, you get these situations of like, you know, Woodhouse and like the hardware, okay. and, you know, all this, all right. and you're just kind of grooving with it, and that's actually much more realistic to the world than what we often depict in sci-fi where everything is top down yes you know like it's designed it's, it's been way. designed from top to bottom to all kind of blend together and all seem like it's kind of related and it all it, it all came from the same source uh, we we see that as beautiful but actually that's oppressively authoritarian interesting you know interesting um, wow if i mean i i i had not even remotely thought uh, about that from that uh, perspective i mean that had not even occurred know. to me. But as soon as you said that, it was like a freaking lightning bolt. I mean, you've seen a Giger painting, right? Can sure. you imagine if everything you saw, everything you wore, everything you touched was Giger? What a goddamn That's nightmare. That's impressive, right? Yeah. yeah. But in his in his art, it's like, it's, it's great in that window. It's beautiful. It all fits together. But like, at some point, it's like, give me a break. Yeah, <laughs> you wouldn't want yeah. to live in that. Right? When you legitimately see it, like you said, it's when you see it within the window, within the frame of the painting itself, it, it's it's one thing because you're seeing it on a wall surrounded by all this other whatever. But when you see it, but then you see it translated into the film. And I'm thinking about when they, I was thinking about when they go into the, um, into the um, reactor building at, in Aliens. And okay. that basically they've, the aliens have transformed the everything about it into basically just that organic look, you know, all those different repetitive elements and whatnot. But, but uh, now I say that, but then I'm just like, no, because it's still blended with the, um, yeah. with the structure itself. So you still had elements of the structure it's, protruding from within all that organic material. You know how, I <clears throat> think of where, but like, you know, those sci-fi rooms where it's like everything is white mm. and then somebody shows up wearing all white. And it's all clean, organic. You know, it's like that type of uniformity is oppressive in its own other way, right? You like, can. See, I'm thinking in my in my head, they illust. I think the most recent illustration that I've seen of what you're talking about would have been Andor, the TV show Andor. That's okay. basically the prequel to Rogue One. Yeah, yeah. Where yeah. the um, where basically anything that's related to the Empire. There's a um, oh the ISB the um internal security bureau of the right. um, of the uh, empire is exactly what you're describing room white chairs white table white uniforms for the most part white um and then it's and then you go you move on from the coruscant set to i can't remember the name of the, of the planet that they're all from and it's it's far more indigenous it's industrial and it has its own culture that's of it that's very much related to the stone that they produce and um but yeah just the oppressive qualities of everything just being all that stark white i'm you can feel them in that show and it's keith lee makes a good point (laughs) (laughs) nobody's making a choice in the in a setting like that so like as a you know as a designer like I think sometimes if you're if you're trying to be realistic, you, you're trying to whatever, like you, you kind of have to imagine the improvisation of the characters in the world you're designing. Hmm. Um, you can certainly take that away for a certain look, but I think a lot of people aren't necessarily conscious of what happens when you have everything be like that. And I think Giger, Giger meant to do that. Sure. Right, like he, he was, you know, yeah. Um, and he wasn't trying to like do a friendly landscape for anybody, but like oftentimes, like I see certain movies, I don't want to like say any names, but yeah, but like you know, you you look at it and you know, I know what they're trying to do, but they didn't do it because mm. it was so ordered or so structured, it just wasn't messy enough. Okay. Right? Um, 
I, I, it works yeah. really well in Star Wars what you're talking about because I mean it was that you've I've they've talked to death the notion of the used universe I mean I and um so I mean I, didn't... I, I, only only to the extent that I mean that there I there's hardly anybody who doesn't who isn't aware of that concept when it came to the design of Star Wars and Tatooine especially I think they they stumbled a little bit in the prequel trilogy Oh well right? that's, yeah. they... on I Coruscant think... I felt like when I looked at um, Tatooine in the was it episode one, mm. <clears throat> I recognized it. I got it, but it didn't feel like old school Tatooine. If only for the grit of the camera. Maybe that's all. You know what I'm saying? Like that the might, old yeah, school kind of fuzzy. Yeah, never underestimate that. Yeah. Um, but it <coughs> felt me. like a little bit, yeah. Uh, and I, and I didn't see that again up until like the much more recent stuff. And, and I think the Mandalorian, somehow they've captured that, like, you know, there's a lot of junk here. Like they just somehow captured that vibe a little bit. I think and, from what um, I understand, the notion was that the, uh, the town, there were two separate uh, towns um, in the original trilogy. It was Mos Eisley, obviously, but in the sequel trilogy, the first two films, especially were, based in Mos Espa, which is a less of a lawless town, um, okay. has more more governmental structure and more control, this, in this case of the huts. Uh, so when looked at it from that perspective, you might, you might see why they would lean a little bit more away from the whole used universe because it's a much richer community, especially later on down the line in the time of the Mandalorian. Um, I think Boba Fett, the book of Boba Fett, a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff happens in Mos Espa. Um, so that, I think that goes a long way towards explaining that. I mean, if that's, I'm not sure if that helps. But, uh, I don't know. Like I, again, <clears throat> I don't know it that well. It's just like, to me, um, I guess when you're, when you're crafting a universe like that, um, if somebody has to know it to feel it, I feel like maybe something isn't quite working. Because uh, I didn't know that's, that's, that's Jack gonna about be... the first ones. I just felt it, right? Like, okay, this is Empire Space. You can just feel it. That's going to keep right? me up at night now because you're going to make <laughs> you're going to make me question all of the things that I thought that I knew and could and could explain about Star Wars just based on my now my somewhat well, I mean, deep knowledge of that universe, but no. I think you're right. I'm just saying, like, the for the artists that work on it or people that, you know, I don't think it's the artist's fault. Sometimes it's, like, the production realities or whatever. It's, like, you know. Well, yeah, that's the production reality aspect of it. I, I That kind of makes a lot of sense. I'm, I remember talking to Jesse at Sideshow about um, – about the pro because that that guy has just like an encyclopedic knowledge of things that went into the creation of of um of props and whatnot for the original trilogy. Yeah, I love and, that dude. Yeah, dude. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know that that love was shared, but uh, whatever. <laughs> um, but he um he explained to me the way he worded it was those guys were just lazy. <laughs> they they legitimately were. I mean, the difference between the original trilogy. Especially the original film, and mm -hmm. this and this the prequel trilogy, is a lot of that lies in the way that they would create the props and the set pieces and whatnot. They were they were they were scavenging, they were cannibalizing right. from from uh, all kinds of different things just to just to assemble something new, and just taking just junk like like in the case of the um, the interior of the Jawa sound crawler. There's just junk thrown everywhere which definitely contributes heavy, heavily to what we're talking about here. Whereas I think that once the prequel trilogy came along, then they were, there was a whole lot of mold and cast going on. It, it, just, it just seems like they were designing then sculpting all their props rather than cannibalizing them from stuff that came from, that came from elsewhere. Mm. I don't think they really got back to doing a lot of cannibalizing until maybe the post Disney days, but I could be wrong. You, yeah. you know what that sounds like? Tell me. It's like if somebody is like essentially doing jazz, right? Yeah. They just like freestyle jam this amazing solo 
and then somebody creates the sheet music and then makes oh. somebody else play it. <laughs> That's great. Right? Yeah, I see that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess it's the same notes, but... <laughs> You know, I, I want to step, I want to walk back what I just said regarding the prequel trilogy <laughs> about them not really borrowing so much from other, you know, just like bringing things on onto the screen and riffing off of it. Because that Jedi communicator that Qui-Gon was using in, in episode one, and maybe you don't know this, I didn't know it for years, is legitimately a, a lady's razor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, hold on a second. I, hold on a second. Just bear with me. Yeah. <laughs> I happen to have a Jedi communicator right here. <laughs> but yeah, do you remember these? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah I have seen, yeah. The, I think they were, I want to say that I can't remember if they were pink or green or maybe both. But yeah, it's, I want to say it's a Gillette something or other. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah, it's weird, right? I saw this, uh, I was listening to like a tech video and they were talking about phones. Okay. And like how, from a design perspective, like what the iPhone introduced creates this design problem where eventually it's just going to be a featureless rectangle. Like, <laughs> That is the most what? futuristic iteration. Like, like, you know, the final expression of it is just nothing. But, but the object, like, no as it, buttons, as it becomes, no, no as it becomes holes, cleaner, no. Yeah, the tendency yeah. goes to making it cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. Right. Versus, I'm like, comfortable okay. with that. Right, but but I mean, like. If you think about futuristic things, sometimes we like make it really, really complicated. Right. Mm -hmm. But actually, if if the razor fits well in the hand, because you're going to like. I guess that's true of a communicator, too. Right. Because it's just. Sure. Yeah. OK. All right. <laughs> you know? I see where I see where you're going. Um, there's just certain things that aren't going to. And it does fit remarkably well in the hand. But um, yeah, it's anyway. Yeah, I we don't know. Should, like, I should probably okay. wrap this up. The oh, yeah. stream has been going for two and a half yeah. hours now. We can, I'm going to go. This is what this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to end the stream, but I'm going to continue mm -hmm. talking to you, um, okay. if you don't mind. Yeah, if you have time. Um, so yeah, I'm going. Um, anyway, before we go, if you, I mean, if you want to take advantage of this opportunity to tell anybody what it what it is that you're working on right now, or anything that they need to know to, if if anybody's interested in following you on uh on social uh, media. Yeah, I think you put the. Uh, the IG out there, Jacob Mavinga, I think that's the most the current content. I mean, okay. I'm on, on my website, mavinga.com kind of links to everything. Um, I wish I could announce the thing that I'm working on. It's just that Understood. certain things haven't been signed or whatever. But if you look behind me, you can probably see that there's comic book pages. Um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> once, once that's ready to go, um, it's going to be out there. But yeah, I am... I've done a lot of different things, but I'm I'm really kind of. It's always been about storytelling for me, and so I'm kind of getting back to that. So I'm doing some comics work. Good. Hopefully, I, I, I know we talked about that for a, a long time, and um, I'm kind of excited to see you get get into that. Yeah. So please, so please keep me posted. I'm aware that you did quite a few covers. I want to say image right. You were doing um. Things related so, to Fathom and um... Aspen Comics. They're they're Aspen, their own. They're apart it. from the mission. Yeah. So I did. Um, this was gosh, 2018, 19, something like that. That's right. I did um, a series of covers for the Artifact One series. So I did all the variants yeah. for that series. I did some um, Soulfire covers. Okay. When we had done the the statue um, to kind of like cross promote a little bit. Um, I have the Artifact I did One a, stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had my LCS order it. So, yeah. I think I, I, think I, I, I know I sent you. I know I sent yeah. you one of the first a, a photograph of the first one that I picked up. But yeah. 
I think I wrote Gash for such a long time ago. Yeah, it was. But yeah, I did a, a short story for Humanoids. I kind of wanted, you know, we're talking about doing more, but like pandemic and all this stuff happened. It just didn't mm-hmm. happen. So um, this next project, I hope, you know, it does what it should. Um, but yeah, I'm just trying to really focus on that. And um, I'm working with uh, Creative Beast Studio. So they just did a, a big Kickstarter uh, okay. for the cyberzoic uh toy line oh that's yeah oh my yeah. god i forgot all about that i'm so glad you brought that up i was this close to uh to jumping all in on that but um e- everything being where it is with my with my car being totaled and the mounting medical bills and things like that i um yeah oh, i definitely wow. needed to um pump the brakes on on spending money on toys so yeah well um We'll talk after because I, you know, they just yeah. they've started a podcast and so many just different ways to connect and and um, cool. but yeah, that line is really really amazing. So he, he took yeah. his Beast of the Mesozoic and other dinosaurs, and he's doing uh, an IP with like uh, it's a sci-fi project where in the future another planet they've resurrected dinosaurs to like actually do warfare and all kinds of stuff with, and it's all it's Jura- like Jurassic Wars. Yes, tech meets yeah. dinosaurs meets dragons, and so anyway, that's legitimately where doing... I wanted the third Jurassic Park sequel to go. I I, I really thought it would go there, but they they, they, they missed that opportunity. So anyway, I've, anyway, I'll be posting some concept art for that. So I do that um, on the side. So awesome. You know, along with you know, I sell prints, art books, and that kind of thing, just to, like connect with people and um, you know, getting our art out there. I think one of the challenges with Sideshow was that all the stuff you know was like in-house NDA yeah. stuff until it's out. So now I want to like just do my stuff and show people. So. Yeah, perfect opportunity for it. Yeah, yeah, you're in a good place for that now. Okay, well, um, thanks for thank you for thank you for joining it the 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 stream. I've, I've really got to work on awesome. my outro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, thank, I really appreciate you taking the time to join me today. It's, it's great. I mean, not only is it great to have you on the stream, but it's great to have the opportunity to catch up with you. And I think that that's kind of the direction that I'm going to be heading when I, when I host, um, when I host guests on, on the, um, on the channel. Uh, it's just it, less, less of a, just more of like a conversation, like let's get caught up. Or in the case of Paul yeah. Hernandez, I mean, I basically knew nothing about Paul Hernandez. We worked together <laughs> for like two years, and and we never really took the time to get to know each other. So this is you know this is a great medium for that. And as long as anybody's willing to tune in and listen and ask questions and talk and learn something new, then I'm I'm all for it. So I'm going to continue with this. I'm going to thinking about seeing if Emilcar wants to join me next time. So that'd be cool. Uh, He's yeah, been up to a lot of amazing things. He's well. Sure. That's that's just his way doing amazing yeah. things is what he does that's his that's his jazz all right um yeah thanks again and uh guys everybody thank you thank all, everybody who actually like all what three or four people who stuck around and watched the don't watch all the way to the end that's some serious stamina y'all uh very happy with you and very sad and sorry for you at the same time but um thanks for joining us uh tune in again next week when hopefully i'll have another six go figure to unbox and uh and pose up and or maybe even a special guest who the hell knows what's going to happen i'm legitimately making this up as i go so until next time everybody have a good weekend have a good week afterwards and until then be good to your plastic.